Well, welcome everybody to this December meeting of the Regulatory Committee. Um, thank you to everybody for being here. I'm going to start by reading the names of the members present so you can all confirm that you are here. Um, can you also, can I remind you that uh, you need, if there, for every item you need to be present for the whole of the meeting of that item being discussed and if for any reason you do leave uh, the meeting uh, then of course you can't vote. Um, those are the rules. So I'll start now by going through the members. Uh, I'm Peter Latham, I'm present. Um, Lance, are you present? Can you confirm? Good morning from Hailing Island. Right, morning Lance. Uh, next one is, is uh, Councillor Bolton Ray. Can present, you Chair. Uh, you're, you're here as a deputy. Thanks for coming, Ray. You're Great well. Uh, Councillor Carter. Confirmed, Chairman, I'm present. Yeah. Councillor Chowdhury is the new <coughs> member, but he and he will be coming. Uh, Later on, he has another meeting and he will let us know when he arrives. He has been ad advised as to the provisions with regard to voting. Um, Mark, Mark Cooper. Uh, good morning, Chairman. Present. Morning, Rod. Morning, Mark. Rod Cooper. Yes, good morning, uh, Chairman. Present. Uh, Andrew, Andrew Gibson. Yeah, I'm here. Keith, Keith House. Good morning, world. Morning. Uh, Roger, you're here too. Roger Huckstep. Yes, I am, Mr Chairman. Good morning from Good morning. the Mian Valley. Uh, Council of Irish, Wayne Irish. Good morning, Chairman from Eastley, I'm present. Good. Um, Councillor Alexis McAvoy. Yes, sir. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning. I'm here. Morning. Thank you. Stephen, Stephen Philpot. I can see you. You're present. Good morning, Peter. Morning. And Councillor Price, you're here too. Yes, morning, Peter. Morning, Roger. Um, good to see you, everybody. So let's push on. Um, I'm required to tell you the uh, provisions with regard to voting. So all decisions will be reached with a roll call vote. Uh, you'll be asked individually whether you want to abstain, vote for or against the recommendations and it will be the voting will be conducted by Katie uh, Sherwood um, who will deal with that as and when the circumstances arrive um, and then we'll move on to the next item. i um, like to remind members that understanding orders uh, so can you keep your mics muted unless you're called on to speak um, and just to remind everybody that you are visible on screen even if you are not speaking. So that's everything I need to say to start the meeting running. So if we could now firstly move to the agenda and apologies. Um, and I think we've got four apologies actually. Um, Jane Franken, Councillor Pal Hare, who is a new member, Councillor Gary Hughes, and Council, Councillor Neville Penman are all um, absent today. So that's item number one. Item number two, declarations of interest. Normally you say that your if you have any declarations which you wish to uh, mention at the time of the item on the agenda, anybody want to raise anything now? If not, we can move on to the item number three, the minutes of the last meeting. Any members, if you have any comments on the minutes, can you say so now? And if not, I'll assume they're all agreed. No comments, right, so let's move on to next item number four is deputations. We've got 10 today. Um, seven from members of the public, three from county councillors, which means that the members of the public will each be given eight minutes each to 
speak and county councillors will be given up to 10 minutes to speak. Uh, as they are called, I will remind them that they will be given notice one minute before their time of eight minutes elapses. And also, um, I... So County Council will get 10 minutes um, and after each deputy speaks, uh, I will stop for a moment to allow members to have any questions which they wish to put to the deputies and then we will move on. So that's the provision with regard to deputies. Um, I'll move on now swiftly to chairman's announcements. Uh, the un only real announcements I've got to make are in relation to changes to the committee. Uh, we have lost uh, councillors Jan Warwick and Roland Gib Dibbs, and I thank them for their contributions to the committee. I would welcome Pal Hare and Charles Chowdhury as their, sub if they as their replacements, but as they're not here, I can't. Um, but so there you go. I'll welcome Charles when he does arrive, and I also welcome uh, Ray Bolton, who is our new deputy member, and I'm grateful to him for attending. Um, it could be a longish meeting. Um, I will, I'm aware that people may want, wish to get up and move around uh, during the meeting. Um, I will have a comfort break at some stage during the meeting. Um, it could well be after item seven, but it will really depend on how swiftly we move through the agenda. Uh, but I will bear it in mind that, uh, that, that we all need breaks. So that's the only announcements I've got to make. And so I think we can move swiftly now to item number six, which is the Robert Mayles, Robert Mays School. If we could move on to that. As far as that item is concerned, um, Kirk Denton will be introducing the item. It's for the provision of two new grass pitches with no flood lighting on a site immediately adjacent to the school with provision of fencing to control access and new gated link paths from the school. The need for the, the uh, fields and for the uh, land is because there is a shortfall of uh, fields for uh, sport provision in the area. So there is a need for these uh, for this application. Um, and so it has already, I believe, been approved in principle at a previous planning meeting in 2017. So the site is approved um, and it is a question of moving forward with this application. Um, and I will ask Kirk to present and give full details of it. Thank you, Chair. I'll uh, just share my screen. Hello, can you all hear me okay? Yeah, I can. I've got it. Excellent, thank you. Um, yeah, so as already explained, the application is for the provision of two grass pitches. No flood lighting is proposed. The retention of uh, large areas existing habitat. Provision of fencing to control access around the new pitches and new gated link paths from the main school campus onto the new pitches. And this is at Robert May School. You know, um, so the application site is edged in red here. Um, you have houses to the north and to the south. It's the site is to the west of Odeham. Um, as I said, there's residential dwellings to the north and the south. And running to the west of the application site, just on the my cursor here, we have uh, a public footpath which runs through the site, uh, adjacent to the site. 
the application site is edged in red again. We've got the main school campus edged in blue. There is a change in levels on the site with land um, is higher at the south and it, it lowers to the north. I think there's a change in levels of approximately seven metres. You see in the areas to the south here, there's existing car parking spaces for the school, which will also be available for when the, um, the fields are used for community use. So there's already 91 car parking spaces and coach bays in this area here, which coach bays can be provide 31 car parking spaces and 35 cycle parking spaces are available. Access to the fields from the main school field, main school site, there'll be a larger gated access in the, in the middle here and a pedestrian access just further south. The application proposes a larger 11 side pitch on the north side that will be proposed to be 115 by 64 meters with the grass pitch and the smaller pitch to the south will be a seven side pitch approximately 70 by 50 meters in size fencing is proposed on the site to secure access to the facility the north of the site and part of the western boundary is proposed to be three meter ball catching fencing uh, to obviously to prevent loss of footballs um, and other equipment. There's um, existing public access to the north here that won't be prevented in, um, as a result of development. Tree planting and other habitat creation is proposed as well as part of the application. There's going to be some off-site tree planting here to the west and further planting to the north. Now, during the course of the application, uh, the county ecologist has recommended that there's going to be the um, increase in grassland habitat. The applicants have agreed that they can provide trees and grassland habitat to ensure there's no net loss of biodiversity and appropriate habitat creation as a result of the development. So this is the example of the proposed fencing. It's open, lightweight fencing. It's not a solid structure. The ball catching fencing will be three meter high in short periods and 1.8 meter perimeter fencing around the rest of the site. Photographs will show from the south of the site. So here we have the access to the public footpath, the schools on the left and the houses on the right. This is looking viewing north. This is viewing south, so you can see the south is higher than the north of the site. We've got the Odham footpath seven on the western boundary application site. In this photograph, the school is on the right hand side and the application site is on the left. So you can see it's um, a, a lit footpath with street lights. You've got the houses to the north. This is a, a newish development, I think the last 10, 15 years. Um, the school is on the left hand side of the photograph with the application site on the right. This is the existing pedestrian school access. Uh, there's going to be a proposed new gated access opposite this gate to allow pedestrian access into the new facility. Um, this is the northern boundary. So where the area of my cursor is, is the water main area. So this will be remaining open. You can see there has been, you can see with the rabbit guards on the trees, there's been some new tree planting proposed. Um, and over the years, there's been some informal access into the site as people have been walking on the site. Just around this area here, there's a gated access into the residential dwellings here. There's a little gate there where residents can walk uh, access along here. So as you said, there's already public access within the site. There's some people walking um, from the east to west direction when I made a site visit. Here's existing school fields in the background. Application site here is on the left. I've uh, got a, a little video of the site. It will just take a moment to load up and wake up. Um, the first round will be a bit blurry, but then it will clear. So I hope I'm not making you dizzy, but this is a 360 view of the northern boundary of the site. <clears throat> the centre of the site is um, grown um, 
to scrubland with some emergent habitat creation. The county ecologists have viewed there'll be no harm to protected species and appropriate conditions can be used to secure uh, appropriate habitat post-development. As this is given an indication of the center of the site. When I made my site visit, you can see some of the uh, uh, collection points and survey points mm -hmm. from the ecology surveys. Um, so as the chairman has already said, just giving a bit of a back background, uh, um, the principle of the development has already been established with the grant of the previous permission for one grass pitch to the north. In that application, the southern aspect of the application site was to remain open. Uh, this application has come in due to, uh, to for the need of additional sports pitches, which is why this the application has come in and the previous application has expired as well. In the neighbourhood plan, the application site has been allocated for educational use. That was, the plan was adopted in 2017 and would have been subject to significant public consultation. The land is also a safeguarded land within the local plan. So safeguarded land for education, according to policy INF8 of the adopted Hart local plan. So there's a lot of policy support for the application is compliant with policy and there's previous applications being granted on the site. In regards to consultation responses, uh, there's been no, no objections from statutory consultees. Um, of, of key note within here, uh, the rights of way manager have got no objections to it because I showed you those photographs of that tarmac footpath. They've got no objection to the proposal, although have provided conditions uh, and notes to prevent any harm to that footpath uh, and appropriate mitigation if there is any damage to the footpath. The county ecologists have recommended conditions, and this is in relation to habitat creation post development. This has been discussed with the applicant who has agreed at the recommendations, and is um, confident they can provide what has been requested. Uh, there's been no objection from environmental health. Support England support the application, um, and there's been a total of 12 representations from members of the public. Uh, their objections relate to um, disturbance during the construction phase, um, potential noise pollution, uh, and during the use of the facility, disturbance during the days and weekends. The proposal uh, would generate more traffic and parking problems in the area. Uh, privacy to the properties would be reduced. The proposal will compromise security to properties. It would result harm to natural wildlife and habitat. Um, closing of walkways during works could cause inconvenience. <coughs> Uh, the existing pitches are under, underutilized and their proposal could devalue properties and spoil existing views from the back of houses. So that's what um, main public concerns of the application are. So as a verbal update to the report, the Lead Local Flood Authority have provided no objection, although have recommended the condition. So this condition, um, if it's, if this application has been granted permission and with your agreement would be added to any consent that this will be in addition to other conditions so i've put all the wording in there so apologies for the heavy slide it's just so everyone is aware of the proposed condition so it's a pre-commencement condition uh, requesting detailed surface water drainage scheme for the site and infiltration test so due to the use of the facility will be grass field it wouldn't be hard standing on the land um, and there wouldn't be any further concerns regarding drainage issues. Um, the flood authority just wanted confirmation that the appropriate drainage assessment has been taken place and would be appropriate drainage provided. Uh, and I think there were some potential concerns regarding groundwater levels, but there's been no objection. However, they just would like this condition proposed or added to any consent. So going just quickly going over the key issues. Um, it's related to providing a shortfall in playing field provision, potential impact on adjacent residents, design of proposals, loss of summer open space and impact on the local environment. Uh, 
those detailed within the report offices a uh, confident the proposal would not have an adverse effect, effect upon protected species as a result of the ecology surveys received and a professional advice received. The application would provide additional playing pitches which would be required by the school. There wouldn't be an increase in traffic flows. Um, the appropriate parking is provided within the school campus. Uh, there's no increase in flood risk and no harm to residential immunity. Um, due to existing use of the site and screening proposed and has been planted and what would be planted in the future. So the recommendation, because um, there's actually also a 106 on the site so it's historically to keep the land as open land. So we are asking uh, members to grant the director authority to grant plan permission to this once this section 106 has been uh, agreed and amended. <coughs> so the recommendation is that um, subject to all parties amending a section 106 agreement between Hart District Council and the landowners for the land to be retained as open land. The director of economy, transport and environment be authorised to grant permission subject to the condition listed in Appendix A uh, and also the updated condition I've provided just moments earlier from the lead local flood authority um, and just to conclude here of here's a refresh of the, the site plan thank you chair thanks kirk um i'll thanks for that report uh, i'll now move over to the consultee uh, deputations and there are two this morning on this item first deputy is liam Pres presley and colin lord who are speaking on behalf of the applicant. So the floor is yours. You have a total of 10 minutes, uh, eight minutes. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Um, good morning, Councillors. My morning. name is um, Liam Presley. I am a, a what's called a delivery manager in, in property services. Um, as has been described this morning, um, the planning application to provide additional team sports playing pitches at Buttonfield mm -hmm. was first approved uh, by this committee in January 2017 and is to su supplement and complete the construction works to expand the Robert Mays School uh, internal teaching facilities originally approved by this committee in the summer of 2016. The expansion of the school um, has facilitated an additional 150 pupil places to enable the school's capacity to grow from 1,200 places or eight forms of entry to 1,350 places and nine form entry school. The, constru the construction project to provide the additional teaching facilities started on site in the summer of 2017 and completed in the autumn term of 2018, allowing the school to increase its planned admission number to 270 pupils in the autumn of 2019. The construction of the additional um, pitches at Buffenfield will bring the school's external sports facilities more in line with the government's minimum guidelines for a school of this size. My colleague Colin Lord, who is the lead pro uh, project landscape architect, will now provide further information to support this proposal. Thank you, councillors. Thank you, Liam, and good morning, councillors. Uh, as Liam stated, Grass pitches are needed by the school who are currently managing for the shortfall of grass field of over 15,000 metres squared compared to government guidelines for a secondary school of this size. <clears throat> Much of the sports field that they currently have is at a steep slope and is barely usable for sport at a reasonable level. This proposal before you would provide 11,900 metres squared of grass pitch area whilst working exceedingly hard to protect and reprovide natural habitat area. This will include 9,474 metres squared of the best existing habitat being retained. It will include 1,300 metres squared of new habitat planting being created on the existing Robert May school site and 1,600 metres squared on the Buffman Field site. This will actually include the planting of over 630 new trees and the creation of 2,000 metres squared of new species rich wildflower meadow. 
You will be aware that the previous application approved in 2016 included less grass sports pitch area and even more wildflower grass habitat. This was a temporary solution to land purchase issues that we were experiencing at the time, which meant the sport smaller pitch would not have been fully in our ownership and therefore unable to be used for sports. We are confident we have overcome the land transfer issues and would seek your approval to proceed with the inclusion of the second pitch. Finally, I'd like to put this application in context with some insight as to how this land appeared when I started working on the project in 2012. The land at that time was rough and bare of vegetation. It had been a farmer's agricultural field prior to the landowner, the developer of the housing, purchasing it and developing the northern half for the new housing you saw in the photos. It had been left in poor condition. Building debris was buried in many areas and waste topsoil from Eltham Heath had been spread roughly over it. The, land, the, the, the building developer was required to leave it clear as open space, but were not committed to any further landscape works to make it usable as such. With no interest in it from the local community in general, the land started to grow over and is now dense with undergrowth, as you will have seen. The school are the only body who are shown interest in maintaining any community activity on the land and their commitment to taking it on for school, community curricula and curriculum uses is very welcome. Most importantly, if approved, this will allow the school to almost reach government guidelines for sports provision, as, as you will hear they are short of currently. We believe that the scheme put before you balances this new managed use with a huge commitment to retaining habitat conservation area. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Colin. Uh, members, do you have any questions of either of the deputies? It looks as if that's clear and there are no questions. Ah, Councillor Cooper. Councillor Cooper. All right. OK, um, it looks as if there are no questions of the deputies. Um, so we'll move on to uh, Councillor Glenn um, as uh, wishes to speak on this item. So, Jonathan, the floor is yours. You have up to 10 minutes. Jonathan. Thank you very much, Chairman, and, and good morning to you all. Um, I'm really here just to make sure we have we ease the passage through of this. So I won't need 10 minutes as a sort of deputation. <laughs> I just wanted to listen to uh, what debate you're going to uh, take part in. And because I fully support um, the principle of providing two more green pitches for Robert May School. It's a top class school and it's on a constricted area. And as you've heard, even with these two pitches, it almost reaches government qualifications for for uh, recreation. Um, I've been involved in this from about 2013, 14. I've walked it about three times and I'm very intimately knowledgeable of the area. Um, from the school's point of view, I sent to the chairman and the, the uh, officer the school's comments and I'll I will go over them very quickly. The principal of the school is very keen that we have significant tree and shrub screening, which has been mentioned by um, Mr. Denton. Um, and, um, and this will be situated between the playing areas and the residential housing. Now that's really important. I'll come on to the residents' point of view in a second. Um, the school does not want the responsibility for the public foot bath. It doesn't want responsibility for the lighting and it doesn't want responsibility for the significant tree screening and the revised path around the playing area. Um, they also suggest that Southern Water, who have put a line through the northern uh, side of the uh, playing field area, that they remain responsible for any shortfall um, in required tree or shrub screening uh, near the residential area. Uh, now, from the residents' point of view, I'm well aware, and that's quite understandable, um, how the, 
local residents nearby might feel. So I think, and we have heard from um, Colin Lord and Liam Presley on this, um, that there will be noise mitigation, that there will be light mitigation, and that any loss of habitat by removal of foliage will be replaced to the best of our abilities. Um, the residents obviously have a fear of foliage um, being taken away or the removal of foliage. And I think it would be a good idea to send letters out to adjacent properties to explain to them what's going on and to tell them that we are actually we're going to be replacing habitat in some form or other, such as the 630 trees and the wildflower meadows. meadows. Communication is everything, Chairman. Um, Community benefit. Now, that's an interesting one because I was at the local parish council meeting yesterday and this topic of community benefit cropped up and we are talking about public money. So in principle, I'm all for it. However, we the school would like to discuss with officers and to discuss with the Odium Parish Council um, important issues such as security, safety, liabilities, insurance, littering, and the safeguarding of children. Absolutely vital, that last one, okay? Because we all are aware of the problems of, of opening up school premises to, to outside bodies, and we don't want um, nefarious activities to take place. Um, and so the school would like time to actually discuss the finer points. Um, and from the Odium Parish Council's point of view, are we expecting Odium Parish Council to adopt the buffer zone? That is a question of mine. Um, I'd like to thank Mr. Denton for his presentation, and it's been a joy to work with Liam Presley and Colin Lord. And I'd like to pay tribute to Mark Saunders, who has been his lead officer in this, who's worked on it and has kept me informed of everything that's been going on for the last seven years. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Glenn, for your comments. Um, you've raised quite a few issues, which I'm sure the officers will uh, take on board. Um, you've also raised a particular issue with regard to Odium Parish Council and the buffer zone. Um, I'll now ask the members to, if they have any questions which they wish to put to the officers, and perhaps when the, if they do have any, if the officers would speak again uh, and answer Councillor Glenn's query with regard to the buffer zone. So, any Thank questions you. of the officers? Chairman, I think Councillor Quantrill has a question of the one of the deputations. All right, okay. Councillor Quantrill. Uh, thank you. It was a question for Councillor Glenn. So if the officers would oh, right, take yeah. the questions first, uh, I'll, I'll wait uh, and, until that section is over before um, asking a question of Councillor Glenn. OK. Can the officers... Can, or can somebody answer Councillor Glenn's question? Yes, I'm... I'm Happy to answer that question. Good. Um, okay. We, we do have uh, confirmation from the parish that they would be interested in uh, maintaining the buffer zone between the school playing field and the, the housing to the north. But the finer detail of whether they would actually uh, purchase the land. Uh, from us, should should we become the landowner of that area, uh, needs to be worked through. Uh, currently, the application before you doesn't include that land. It's outside of this application area, and therefore, uh, I, and uh, potentially not going to be part of the land purchase, uh, which would mean it would remain actually in the ownership of the housing developer for. Uh, communication then to, to evolve with, between the parish, facilitated by ourselves, uh, as we have some interest in uh, reaching resolution on that zone. So we, we are intent on facilitating a, a, a reasonable solution for that area. OK. Uh, that's great. Councillor Quantrill, you have a question of Councillor Glenn. Thank you, Councillor Glenn. Uh, well done for seven years of hard work. 
Um, okay. One question comes to mind is if those issues are resolved, which you've um, alerted council officers to, of what community benefit will this um, add collectively then to the provision of such um, field sports in other areas in your division? Uh, well, Lance, thank you very much for contacting me earlier and <laughs> warning that, that you were going to ask me a question. <laughs> um, because I wasn't, I wasn't actually, community benefit was not something that had been discussed much during the uh, build up towards A, the uh, principle, the agreement in principle a couple of years ago, um, mm -hmm. and the fact that the two, this is uh, basically another stage in progressing the, uh, the, the, the uh, playing fields. Um, but the parish council last night did ask about community benefit, and we are talking about public money. So, um, I mean, I'm in prince. I'm principal. I'm all for it. Um, however, I have spoken this morning already to the principal of the school, saying, "How do you feel about this?" Because I wanted to know. I want to be able to talk from strength, and I have already told you at least of the, the six or seven issues that she's brought up. Um, in a rather short time, and they're important issues. They're important issues. So I'm all for um, other schools being able to use it. Um, the yeah, we've got other schools um, in the area who could certainly take advantage of it. Um, and I'm talking about county schools, um, junior schools. Um, certainly, Hook will ha has a couple of schools who might want to take advantage of it. Um, and that's just my division. There'll be other divisions who might uh, want to do the same. So I think it really is important that there's a proper dialogue set up with the principal, that's Joanna West. Uh, obviously, there'll be legalities with insurance and such like, certainly safety, absolutely paramount. Um, we've got enough, um, how do I put it, local crime going on to annoy the residents. I don't want to create areas for them to proliferate their nefarious ways. Um, and so this has to be taken, uh, dealt with with kid gloves. Um, so the dialogue um, with the groups I mentioned and the parish council are vital. Does that answer your question, Lance? I'm delighted to hear that you've covered all the things which I could think of <laughs> and a few more and, and that uh, Odium has got such a, an active councillor looking at it uh, for them. Thank you. Please write and tell them, will you? <laughs> <laughs> Right, I think we've uh, therefore dealt now with all questions relating to the deputies. Sorry, um, Chairman, we just have one question from Councillor Carter. OK, sorry, Councillor Carter. And another one from uh, Councillor Bolton. Right, thank you, Councillor thank, Carter. Thank you. thank you, Chairman. Well, I'm, I'm very familiar with this site um, and we did look at it when we uh, had a site visit to the school. Um, I'm not quite sure whether this is a question for the applicants or maybe Councillor Glenn as he uh, has just indicated that he's been in discussion with the school. Um, I, I note in the report that um, for um, community use the school um, car parking facilities will be made available but what about other facilities, um, uh, toilets and changing facilities? I, I, I don't know whether I missed it but I can't see that um, mentioned at all. Um, and indeed, as Councillor Glenn mentioned, other schools may be invited um, uh, to use these facilities. Would that be uh, at weekend use? And presumably they, they would be able to use the school facilities. So um, there's perhaps need for some clarification on, on that, that issue. So I'm not quite sure whether that's for Councillor Glenn or the applicant. I think it's probably either the applicant or the officers. Yes. Uh, so can I can I ask uh, Liam Presley if, if he can answer that one? Of course. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor, the I, I would have to check the, the details, but um, part of the, the wider facilities at the school, uh, there is a, a synthetic turf pitch and the the the, 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 the typical arrangement is that a community use agreement is in place and that enables and that's a separate agreement between the school and um, the local authority and that enables the use of the school's facilities 
predominantly for um, the, uh, the, the, the external team sports playing fields, which would include provision of uh, changing rooms. The, the additional uh, uh, sports facilities that we're, we're proposing in this application would come under um, that uh, agreement, but would be very much for the school to manage. Obviously, the, the infrastructure that has been provided as part of the previous construction project um, included significant um, additional parking facilities and coach uh, bays to the front of the school, to the south of the school there. And those, those will be, as been, has been described, made available uh, as part of that wider community use agreement. Does that answer your question, Chris? Yes, fine, thank you. Uh, Councillor Bolton. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, whilst I note in the application there won't be any floodlighting, can we receive an assurance that when these two grass pitches are used in the evening, during the springtime and the summer, that there will be a management plan in place to ensure controlled behaviour on those two pitches? Thank you. I think that is a question which, again, is looks as if it's coming to uh, Liam Presley. Thank, thank you, Councillor. We will obviously work with um, the, the Joanna and the, the school leadership team. It will be very much for the, 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 the school to, to, to manage that and uh, would only be um, uh, an issue um, during the, 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 the summer term. Um, it's quite typical of, of secondary school environments and um, something that, as I say, would, would be the responsibility of the school to, to manage as, the, um, as um, the responsible body. OK, Ray. Fine. Thank okay. you, Chairman. Yes. Do we have any further questions then of the two deputies? If not, then can I thank the deputies for coming and remind you that you play no farther part in this particular item, but you're welcome to stay on uh, to hear the rest of any debate which may take place. Thank um, you. Members, do you have any questions now of the officer Kirk Denton in relation to his presentation? Councillor Quantra. Uh, no, I've I've lowered my hand there, Chairman. Okay. Uh, thank right. you. Anyway, I'm, I've got all my uh, uh, answers from Councillor Glenn that I had to uh, in my mind. Thank you. Okay. Right. So we have no, anybody else have any questions of uh, Kirk Denton? If not, then I think we've dealt with questions, and then we can now move into debate if members wish to debate this item. Does anyone wish to debate it? It looks as if nobody wishes to do so. Um, it's a pretty straightforward application, I would have thought. Um, and if no one wishes to debate it, I'm going to go straight then to the recommendation. Um, and the recommendation is effectively says that subject to all parties amending a section 106 agreement between Hart District Council and the landowners for the land to be retained as open land, uh, Director of Eco Economy, Transport, Environment be authorised to grant planning permission subject to the updated report which we got last night and the conditions uh, which are listed in Appendix A and any additional conditions required uh, following the receipt of any drainage information and consultation responses. That's the recommendation. So I'll pass now over to Katie to lead on the voting. I suspect it should be pretty straightforward, Katie. 
Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, and just a reminder to members that obviously um, if you haven't been around for the whole item, then you'll need to abstain from voting. Um, as we've had no debate, I'll just ask whether there are any members who wish to abstain from voting on this item. If you could just um, speak, speak and let me know. No. Does anyone wish to vote against the recommendation? OK, and could I get a general um, agreement that you are in favour of the recommendation? Agreed. 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 Thank Agreed. you. That recommendation is carried, Chairman. Right. That was easy. Right. Um, does anyone wish to have a two minute break before we move on to item seven? Well, I'll be leaving you, Chairman, but thank you all very much indeed. Yeah, good to see you, Jonathan. Okay. Cheer, everybody. Looks as if you all wish to push on to item number seven without a break. Roger, are you OK? Right. Yes, thank you. OK, so let's move on to item number seven. Um, if we could bring it up on the screen. Katie, is it going to be brought up on the screen, item seven? Um, I think so, Chairman. Yes, the office is just finding the yes. report. Thanks for that. Right, now, item number seven, which is an interesting one. Um, it is for variation of conditions two, nine and ten of an appeal decision, which goes back to 2012. Um, and this application is to reshape improve the existing peripheral northeastern landscape bund to facilitate enhanced screening from wider areas into the site, improve di di biodiversity on the site's periphery, and to accommodate a temporary wash plant operation in the southern section of the site for a period of 12 months only at Salvage Farm Bunny Lane. So what we have here is an, a site which has been used for waste management since 2012 under the original appeal decision. And some members may have been on the committee in 2011 when it, the original application was refused by the regulatory committee at that time. So the principle as a waste management site is, is already established, whatever happens on this application today. And we are therefore looking at this application, which is to improve, improve bunding around the site. And probably this item, the main thing will be to discuss the wash plant which is to be brought on the site um, to facilitate washing of the aggregate soils, etc., which have accumulated over the last 12 months um, because the landowner or the owners of the site haven't been able to move the aggregate soil at sand on fast enough. That basically is what this application is about. And I will ask, uh, see who's presenting this one. And oh, it, it's Sam. Sam, that's the application. I'll ask you now to present it. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can everyone see the, uh, the slides? Not yet. Sam, I think you're sharing your screen. So if you minimise your Teams page, um, that's it. Yeah, that's better. Okay. Yeah, and then just put it Thank in slide view. Yeah. Well, we yeah, we've got item seven now. Thank you. Right, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for that introduction, Councillor Latham. 
Uh, and uh, I won't go through the extremely long description development again, but essentially the applicant is uh, looking to vary those uh, three conditions, two, nine and ten of the uh, appeal decision from uh, 2012. Uh, in terms of the site's location, uh, it's marked out here with, it, with the red line. It's, uh, it's an established waste management facility occupying just over six hectares of land. Uh, uh, it's in a, a countryside location and it's situated approximately four kilometres north of Romsey uh, and due east of Tims, Timsbury village uh, to the west. And the site is accessed from Bunny Lane um, at its southeastern corner, uh, you'll see a, uh, it's highlighted as a site entrance on that corner. Uh, there are a number of uh, isolated properties situated within a 500 metre radius of the site. Uh, I'll show you that in more details on the next slide. Uh, yeah, zoom in aerial photo of, of the site, again highlighting its rural nature. Uh, the site is bounded on uh, the western boundary by uh, its bunding uh, and planted hedgerow, natural hedgerow and trees. Uh, due east and north of the site uh, is restored former minerals workings. And uh, due south and west of the site is open, undeveloped uh, agricultural countryside land. Uh, Bunny Lane, again, looking at the site vehicular access onto Bunny Lane, Bunny Lane runs approximately east-west along the site's southern boundary towards Timsbury village uh, in the southwest core, bottom corner of the slide uh, where it joins the uh, the Romsey Road. You head, you head south towards Romsey. Sam, sorry to interrupt your, your flow. Could you just click on the from current slide in the top corner just to make it a bit bigger for the webcast? Is that all right? Oh, sorry, perfect. is that Thank better? You. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Yeah, that is that is much better. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, members. But right, uh, I'll, I'll move on to the next slide unless anyone wants me to point out anything on this one again. But uh, this is the uh, approved site layout plan that uh, that was approved by the their successful appeal decision back in 2012. Uh, as the report says, the site's divided into three distinct areas. Uh, in the northern area of the site, uh, you've got the stockpile storage areas um, and sort of occupying the main main areas. You've got waste wood, uh, you've got treated soils and uh, adjacent to the northern boundaries of the site and the bunding, you've got areas used for concrete crushing when required and tarmac uh, for screening, uh, screening crushing of tarmac when that's brought in from, from road, you know, road construction and improvement projects in the main. Uh, Moving south through the site into the area highlighted in sort of a brown brownish uh, square shape, you've got the offices, the uh, materials recycling facility building, the way bridge, the uh, welfare facilities for the site, uh, and areas for storage of materials. And uh, yeah, in the main, uh, moving south again, you've got parking and storage areas, uh, and then moving further south. Uh, you've got uh, areas, uh, a lot of this is sort of up, un, underused, but it's uh, again, you've got areas along the western boundary for tarmac planings, uh, road material processing and storage. Uh, it's, it's often it's referred to as foam mix on here. Uh, again, sh a shredding area in the southwest corner and in the southeastern corner of the site, additional an additional area for stock storage. Uh, often used for blending soil, storing soil, skips, other other materials and, and equipment. Uh, again, you can right in the southeast corner of the site, you can see the site entrance onto Bunny Lane, uh, and the uh, uh, previous to this extension being this successful extension in this sort of bottom third of the site uh, being brought into use, the uh, public footpath was uh, diverted. It used to run along the eastern boundary of the site, but it now carries on. Uh, running along the southern boundary site up up Bunny Lane, further east, and then snakes, uh, then heads north uh, back around and towards the northern end of the active site. This is a, a Sam, Sam. Sorry to interrupt you, but before you leave that site, last site, 
could you show on it where the wash plant will be and the height of the bunding? Because I think that may well be a significant issue for determination. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Chairman. I, I was going to mention it uh, shortly, but I will point it out. All right. I'll go back. But, um, yeah, for, for clarity, uh, in this southern section of the site, uh, and again on the adjacent to the uh, western western boundary here, uh, highlighting into a thick thick green line, where you've got this delineated area that says tar tarmac planings foam mix. That's the uh, location of the proposed wash plant. Uh, adjacent to the boundary of the site. Uh, yeah, as, as previously mentioned, you've got the existing site boundary and the periphery of the site. Uh, and just just going back to the other element of this development, the uh, improved peripheral funding around the northern northeastern area site. If I head back to the top of the top of the slide, the the buns, the existing bun at the northeastern corner there will be will be later, laterally and vertically extended to match existing. And along the eastern, northeastern boundary of the site adjacent to this uh, internal access road, the bun there will be uh, increased in height and width as well. Uh, if that's okay, I'll, I'll, I'll move back to that photo, Chairman. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is the view looking north through the centre of the facility. So you've got the car, car parking area, you've got the offices on the right, the Waybridge, uh, Waybridge uh, uh, cabin, uh, yeah, further further offices in, in the background. Uh, right in the background of the picture, you can see the large stockpiles. Uh, and I think for those of you with really good eyesight, you can see a, uh, a grabber on top of the stockpiles, uh, right, in the, right in the background there, just beyond the, uh, over the top of the Volkswagen van. Uh, moving to the next slide. This is an easterly view along the northern boundary of the operational area, right at the top of the site. Uh, so on the left, you've got the peripheral bund, and you can see some tr some established trees just outside the site to the north there. Uh, and then on the right-hand side of the slide, you've got some of the some of the uh, materials that have yet to be fully processed. Uh, the machinery you can see in the foreground there is is a is a screener, and uh, the, the yellow the yellow piece of plant in the background is is that grabber that excavator you could see in the distance in the previous slide. Uh, this is the view of the wash plant, which, um, as mentioned in the report, the applicant has taken the opportunity to install in advance of uh, a, planning a planning decision being taken. Uh, I'll, I'll mention why later. In, well, it's mentioned in the report, but I'll mention that why later on. Uh, this is yeah, view looking uh, from adjoining land due west southwest of the site. Uh, again, you can see. The, uh, the, the the white sort of colour of the of the uh, wash plant uh, on to the to the right of that tree or so to the left of that bear tree you can see the conveyor belt which which runs up towards uh, the, the high point of the wash plant that drops the drops the soils and the materials in to be cleaned uh, and then you've got the other uh, structures related to the wash plant it runs about 70, 70 meters in extent. Uh, north to south along the inside of the site's boundary. Uh, moving to the next slide, I've moved further, further away from the site. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, this is another, another view from the west southwest looking into the site. Uh, you should be able to see just to the left of centre the conveyor belt running you know, um, below the tree line, almost, almost here to the top of the top of the tree line. And then as you move uh, left to right in the centre picture again you can see the white the white large the you know, large white structure again part of part of the part of the uh, the wash plant sort of infrastructure there adjacent to the site boundary uh, this this photo is taken further away uh, it's approximately approximately you know, it's over over 200 meters away it's, it's heading towards the a the uh, Romsey Road um, in the way to Tim, you know, that, that runs north south through Timbury Timbury village this is moving into the site. This is this is on the on the wash plant itself. Uh, so we're looking north along the western boundary. Um, you'll again you'll see that that uh, bear that bear tree that you, in, on the, on the left of the picture. There. You could see on the previous slides from distance. 
<coughs> excuse me, uh, this uh, this piece of the wash plant here, this this is the highest part, which uh, which it, which extends to a maximum of 9.2 meters in height, uh, approximately uh, four 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 point two meters higher than the rest of the the, the wash plant facility, and and you know, uh, the same height above the existing peripheral bands. In terms uh, moving towards a proposal, the uh, the applicant is seeking to vary those three conditions two, nine, ten uh, of the uh, apologies of the successful uh, appeal that was uh, granted in 2012. So condition two is the approved plans and schemes. Condition nine as stands uh, doesn't allow any plant to exceed four meters in height above ground level and condition ten uh, doesn't at the moment does not permit any soil washing in the area where they want it to happen. Uh, so the applicant seeks to vary these three conditions to allow uh, the approved plans and schemes to permit changes to the bunding and site layout by allowing wash plants in the South Western area. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, to amend condition nine to allow the wash plants to be present on site uh, for a 12 month period only and to allow it to be the only part of the site to exceed four metres in height above ground. And condition 10 would be amended if condition nine was to allow the soil washing to take place in that area with, through the wash plant. Uh, there would be a number of other conditions which would need to be up, which will have been recommended to be updated um, and uh, a new one included as a result of these proposals. And, and again, if this uh, if this uh, proposal is is, uh, is uh, given approval, those conditions would be uh, attached as well. Uh, on the screen now is the revised landscape mitigation scheme. Uh, the, uh, go, we'll go to the wash plant first down in the, the bottom sort of left of the site, the south southwest corner. Uh, members, you can sort of see the black layout of the plant there. So running north, north, south in that corner. Uh, again, there's the site already benefits from peripheral bunding in this area on the apologies on the western and western and southern boundaries. This bunding stands at the moment to a height of four meters, and when it's fully um, fully planted and it's uh, you know we haven't had to die back through winter, that gives you another sort of meter of of screening. So in total, the bunds give about five meters, uh, five meters in height. Uh, the wash plant, the, the highest part of the wash plant stands to 9.2 9.2 meters in height, so that element wouldn't be screened uh, in the main. Uh, additional supplementary planting is proposed along sections of the western peripheral bunding only. There's no plans to uh, improve that physically in height. Uh, moving back to the other part of the proposed uh, development, the, chain, the, the changes to the existing peripheral bunding in the north northeastern corner of the site uh, that would be the northern bound the northern peripheral bunding would be extended 10 meters uh, eastward towards the northeastern corner of the site where there's a site access gate uh, again that would be uh, increased uh, to a height of five meters to match the existing peripheral bund and then would be planted uh, appropriately the uh, again, the existing peripheral bund uh, running from the northeast corner down to the centre of the site on its eastern boundary would be increased to a height of four metres as well to match the heights of the western and southern peripheral bunding and again planted uh, as appropriate. It would also be extended in, in thickness uh, to, to allow the height to be increased. Excuse me. This uh, slide is it's one of the appendices in the report, but it's it's a, a series of sections through the sites and bunding. Um, apologies, the top ones are quite small, but it's a distant uh, section uh, from the from the the property, the nearest property on Bunny Lane uh, to the west, and then it's showing its distance uh, between the western site bunding and where the wash plant would be situated behind, which is about 440 metres away. There are there are other properties nearer to the site, but this is the one that we sort of that those photos were sort of zooming in from earlier from the west and the southwest. Uh, moving to the middle uh, 
uh, section of this plan. Again, it's uh, it's showing the the land land to the the land to the west here, the, the nat natural lie of the land, and the existing pre uh, the uh, the existing banding. Uh, and then it's again showing the four meter high banding, which it's indicated five meters. That takes into account the planting as well. Once that's been successful, uh, and showing the that that wood screen, you know, people behind the site and plant being used. Uh, moving to the bottom section, that's uh, that's the section through the proposed in enlarged eastern band, which would be uh, raised in height to four meters and then planted as well. Uh, this is a, a more detailed cross section through the wash plant and viewed from the east from, from within the site looking out. Uh, again, you can see the, the southern bounce, southern peripheral bunding that's in place already. Uh, and uh, you've, you've got an idea here of what essentially wouldn't be screened from the from like main, mainly from the western boundary of the plant with the highest part of the plant there, the conveyor belt uh, structure at 9.2 metres in height. In comparison to the four, four meter high bands with an extra meter once planting has been successfully completed. Uh, this is a photo, as, as I said earlier, the, the plant, the wash plant has been installed already, although it's not been brought into use. Uh, and this photo just gives you a, a real life, uh, real life view of uh, of what was shown on that previous plan. Uh, uh, well, that's a it's a panoramic view, so it's slightly skewed. But again, it's a good uh, gives you a good idea of of uh, you know, how it fits in with the landscape. And the with the to the left of the left of that um, slide, you can see the existing bun planted bunding on the southern boundary of the site, the wash plant infrastructure, uh, buildings and etc. On the sort of left to centre, and then the conveyor belt structures and the washing area with the conveyor belts that. Then uh, drop out uh, clean soil fractions and types into into containers and skips waiting to be taken away. Moving to consultations and representations, uh, so there's a lot on the screen. Uh, Test Valley Borough Council planning uh, had concerns over visual impact, although mm. proposed conditions, if we were minded to approve it, um, environmental health raised no objection. Um, County Councillor Perry uh, shares the concerns raised by the Parish Council, which which I'll mention, and the residents, which I'll mention uh, in a second. And, and then it was he who recommended we bring this to committee to, uh, because of the contentious nature of the site. Uh, uh, Mitchell Merchant Timsbury Parish Council uh, objected over the visual impact of the wash plant, that the works to the bunds were unjustified, that some of the plans that have been uh, submitted and proposed were conflicting and that there would be unacceptable impacts on the local community um, if the development was allowed. They also raised the uh, the fact that the wash plant had already been installed prior to uh, planning uh, planning the planning decision being taken. Uh, Bracefield Parish Council uh, echoes the comments of Mitchell Merch and Tinsbury Parish Council. The environment HC required confirmation of the wash plant drainage measures Southampton Airport, no objection. The county's ecologist um, wanted apologies, wanted uh, further further ecological mitigation in terms of the proposed underplanting works on the buns to ensure that any protected species that were living there or habit, you know, habitats or foraging areas, roosting areas were weren't adversely affected. County landscape again shared concerns over the impact on landscape, but recommended that if uh, conditions would, were imposed uh, for appropriate and immediate bun planting, if again, if a, if a positive decision is, is given today. In terms of the county's lead local flood of property, highways, planning policy and rights of way, no objection was raised by those consultees. And um, moving to public representation, we've only had one from, from uh, an adjacent landowner, although she's contacted us a, a couple of times, but essentially objecting for the same reason as the uh, Mitchell Merchant Hinsbury Parish Council, um, adding that the site's permitted operations are already breaching a number of planning conditions. Uh, that's in relation to some of the heights of some of the stockpile materials in the northern area of the site. Uh, that the site impacts unacceptably on surrounding land. 
and that this development should have been EIA developments um, like the appeal decision was. Uh, moving on to the key issues, there, um, there's, there's five in the main. Uh, the first one, lack of justification, uh, as we've just previously mentioned, the parish council and the uh, land, landowner objecting have, um, have commented that they don't see any need for the improvement to the buns, the peripheral buns, apart from uh, the applicant needing to use some of the over oversized stockpiles to you know, to move that material away from where it is currently. Uh, they've also uh, raised concerns at the retrospective nature of the wash plants that goes against everything that we should be trying to trying to deliver and protect through planning. What what I would add and is what is mentioned in the report is uh, and and chair and the chairman mentioned earlier this site. Uh, what members need to consider here is this site has an is an existing permitted waste management facility. Uh, it's also safeguarded as as a waste management facility within within the county's uh, minerals and waste plan. Uh, it is a contributor to uh, the production of recycled secondary aggregates uh, through cleaning you know, already on site. Uh, you know, cleaning inert, you know, cleaning waste, cleaning waste materials, taking out the usable soil fractions and, and materials that can be used to avoid having to essentially quarry, quarry more materials from virgin, virgin ground. Uh, so, so in that respect, in sort of a policy context, it's a, uh, it is it is an acceptable site, and uh, we we uh, as planning planning team uh, go, we would advise that that it is a justified development. Uh, and in terms of the bunding that, uh, around all sides of the site, the physical changes and the additional planting would help again uh, with with you know, ensuring that the site is remains integrated sympathetically into the area. Uh, moving to visual impact, uh, there there is no doubt that the that the site currently has a has a visual impact in terms of the large stockpiles which are breaching some of the controlled pre planning conditions and, and and again for the wash plant uh, the parts of the wash plant would exceed the the heights of the perimeter bunding as well uh, what we've got to consider here is how unacceptable is that visual impact uh, from the development proposed uh, and whilst the parish council and residents are saying that it is a you know an unacceptable development that can, cannot be mitigated uh, what we've looked at in terms of the wash plant is that it is proposed for only for a 12 month period in, to, to test the success of it. Uh, again, that's from a commercial perspective for the applicant. But in terms of allowing temporary uses, that gives planning authorities the ability to to see how to see how a use uh, uh, works and to assess any impacts during that time. <clears throat> uh, um, and at the end of at the end of that any temporary period, the applicant would need to come back to the planning authority um, and have that discussion as to whether a, a permanent a permanent permission should be applied for, um, and again whether that would be in this location with this plant or perhaps somewhere else uh, within within this site. Obviously, that's that's in the future, but uh, but a, a temporary a temporary planning approval. For, for any piece of kit on an established waste site is a is a good way for an operator and a planning authority to to establish any risk. <clears throat> so going back to sort of visual impact, which I've sort of stepped away from, the the additional works to the bunding will help integrate the changes into into the landscape. And both uh, despite well, despite the uh, borough council and county landscape having concerns over visual impact. They both suggested if, if there is a positive decision today that the additional winter planting is is planted immediately and uh, you know, to take account of the current planting season we're in. Uh, and again, that will be controlled by uh, an amended condition. Uh, ecological impact, as, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, the county, county ecologist has raised some concerns over uh, works to the bunding, and again, that would be uh, controlled through an uh, conditional scheme on the permission if, if permission was granted, just to to ensure a local protected species previously assessed and identified in terms of habitats and feeding areas was was, was you know, continued to be 
continue to be protected. Uh, in regards to both ecology impact and visual impact, subject to those conditions being imposed, that would satisfy the terms of our of our policies, you know, policy five, protection of the countryside, uh, policy three, the protection of nature conservation, and uh, policy 13, design of waste management facilities. Uh, moving to protection of the water environment, uh, the site benefits from a number of uh, surface water management conditions already for, for the whole for individual elements of the site and the wider site. Again, if, if permission was granted today, those conditions would be retained and updated and amended. Uh, and the where the Environment Agency mentioned uh, uh, they wanted further details for the wash plants. Image, recycle and reuse water from a from a, a borehole yet to be <coughs> yet to be uh, installed on the site, subject to environment AC approval. Uh, so the water would be reused within the site. Um, the, the wash plant area would be curbed to avoid runoff, uh, uncontrolled runoff and water, you know, water loss and, and uh, sediment material loss as well. Um, and so from a water environment perspective, with the environment issues concerns uh, satisfied, environmental health at uh, Test Valley, they had some ground concerns as well. That, that The control of these uh, operations would satisfy their concerns. And the lead local flood authority at the County Council were, had no concerns with drainage of uh, surface water issues full stop. So with those um, with those concerns allayed and the proposed condition, you know, conditions in place, again, we we would contend that the uh, water environment would be protected and safeguarded through. Uh, moving to the last key issue, uh, protection public safety, health, public health, safety and immunity. The current planning commission for the site again has uh, approved schemes for the control of noise, uh, control of dust and air quality. Uh, and other standard conditions like the control of hours of use, lorry numbers, waste tonnages per annum. Uh, the, again, these would all, all be retained should planning permission be granted. Uh, and for those reasons and, and a lack of and a lack of uh, uh, substantiated complaints in terms of those uh, parameters being received. Again, the, the changes to the site boundaries and the retention of existing operations would, it would ensure that the uh, local amenity uh, for residents, other visitors to the area would be retained. So moving to the recommendation, uh, we recommend that planning permission be granted subject to the conditions set out in Appendix A of this report and the updated and additional conditions in the update report, which I'll just draw members attention to now. If you've uh, if you've got the update report handy. Uh, Looking at uh, the revision to proposed conditions, condition 12 was an out of date condition which we've just replaced with a, we, we beefed up with wording that is widely used by planning authorities and the environment agency to protect, uh, just you know, to, to adequately store oils, fuels and chemicals, ensure you know, they're not, there's no risk of those being uh, un released into the environment. Uh, condition 13, again, was and back to drainage, we uh, we recommended that some additional controls previously approved and, and proposed now be up, you know, worded into that condition uh, to, to again to beef up the the existing surface water controls previously approved. Uh, moving to uh, page four of the update, uh, I mentioned that the waste 150,000 tons of waste is still the same amount to be imported. But we've added in the the regular wording we use about uh, that the applicant keeps records of those imported volumes, uh, and they they will be released to the, the planning of the request. For an important one for the wash plant use, we've tightened up the wording uh, to read rather than the first soil washing use, we've uh, adjusted it to read within. Within, uh, the use shall cease operation within 12 months of becoming operational. Now, again, that's a, a, con a, a control to ensure that uh, both operator and planning authority, if permission is granted, no, uh, are all working to the same dates and there's no sort of ambiguity involved. Again, the 
again, permission is granted, the County Council would expect to be notified not later than seven days uh, afterward in advance of that first operational use. And moving to page five is then an additional condition uh, to account of some of the concerns raised by uh, the parish council and, and the local resident. Uh, working with the approved conditions 13 and, and 15 on, on the uh, consent already, uh, this, this serves to add that at no time during the carrying out permitted operations, if approved today, shall the site drainage and surface water, so shall any site drainage and surface runoff be allowed to leave the site. And it has been claims that this has happened or historically. Uh, and so with, with, with that in mind, we take the opportunity to control it further, uh, but at the same time, be mindful of uh, other conditions already in force and imposed and, and that the site has an environmental permit issued by the Environment Agency, which also has engineering and drainage control, which, which we would we look to work with rather than conflict with. Uh, and that concludes my presentation. Uh, Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um, um, right. Uh, right. right. Uh, can you take? Oh, you've done that. Can we then move on to the deputations with regard to this item? Um, the first uh, deputation is from Councillor Bob Davis, who is chairman of Mitchellmas and Timsbury Parish Council. Uh, Mr. Davis, you've got eight minutes to address the committee. <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor. Am I am I on? You're on. Yes, I can see you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Chairman. Good morning, councillors. Um, Good morning. I'm Chairman of Mickle Merchant Timsby Parish Council, the salvage farm sites in our parish. It's in the countryside and it's close to the village. Our main concern about this application is the wash plant. It's very large, over 70 metres long and over nine metres high. That's the length of six double-decker buses and at its highest, almost as high as two double-decker buses stacked one on the other. The site's enclosed by the earth buns, but the plant exceeds the height of the buns by more than five metres. The applicant is therefore planning to, wants to modify the planning condition, which was imposed in condition nine by the inspector at the 2012 appeal. That condition serves two purposes. Equipment and vehicles should not be visible above the buns from outside the site. And the noise emitted from the site also is reduced by the effect of the buns. If the, if the condition is to be relaxed to allow the screening effect of the buns to be I'm sorry, this, if the condition is allowed to be relaxed, the effect of removing the screening um, on noise and visual impact should be very carefully examined and we're not confident that it has been. Um, can I remind you that noise was a key issue at the 2012 appeal? And on visual and landscape impact, the wash plant towers over the four metre perimeter bonds by more than five metres. It's clearly visible from outside the site. We know that because, as you've seen from the photographs, it's already been installed without planning permission. The applicant states that the changes will not have any substantial adverse effects on either landscape character or visual receptors. Um, well, I perhaps let you be the judge of that. The Hampshire Landscape Officer and the Tess Valley Landscape Officer had concerns, although the County Landscape Officer gives the view that um, the planting on the perimeter bund um, will have some screening effect in time. But to be realistic, if this really is an application for a temporary installation, anything planted this year is not going to have much effect, if any, over the next 12 months. So we do object strongly to the visual and landscape impact of the wash plant. Allowing plant to be visible above the perimeter bonds is in direct conflict with a key principle applied by the planning inspector in 2012. Um, and it's not clear to us how this feature would comply with policy 13 of the council's waste Man minerals and waste management plan that development should, and I quote, maintain and enhance 
the distinctive character of the landscape. Now on noise, the applicant's planning statement says that no significant noise impacts will occur. There's no basis for that assertion. There's no information on the level of noise emission from the plant. All they can do is to quote the site's operational noise procedure and noise policies. They're completely general in nature. They don't refer to any particular piece of plant, nor to this plant. We don't think it's enough to rely on the fact there is a noise limits on the planning permission. Um, we think there should be reasonable certainty at this stage that those noise limits can be met. The wasp plant's big and complex. It includes pumps, conveyors, vibrating screens. Significant parts of it will exceed the height of the bums and therefore will no part of that plant will be screened in noise terms. The bums will only be four metres high. The any planting, however high, will have no effect on noise emission. Officers, your officer's report says that the applicants propose the construction of a further bum to be situated on the eastern side of the plant to help with screening both visual and noise. And this bum, if required, would be constructed from on-site materials. We don't understand how we don't understand the term if required. If, if, if it's required, we should know now. The whole approach seems to be wait and see. If it's noisy, we might do something about it. So it would have been simple, it would be straightforward to predict the noise from this plant. The manufacturer will have noise information. Noise from a similar plant elsewhere could be measured. And the effect of this plant on the area surrounding this site could be calculated in advance. This is a straightforward procedure, widely carried out. It would take weeks, it could have taken weeks to carry out. At the moment, I believe that uh, the operator, certainly the council is flying blind in asserting that there is no noise, in, no potential noise impact from this plant. I think you should know in advance that there's not going to be a problem, because if there is, the time taken to identify the problem, to devise solutions, perhaps to serve an enforcement notice, which might be appealed, <coughs> could take a long time, maybe months, during which time residents will be exposed to excessive noise. We don't consider this as a satisfactory situation. We also have concerns on dust. I won't go into this in detail. We've expanded on this in our comments in writing to the council. Um, again, there is no information provided on the dust emission from this plant. The material will enter the plant dry and be con con conveyed to a high level. Um, the applicant has produced a stand their standard dust control policy, but again, this is not specific to this plant. It may be the plant includes measures to, to suppress dust. Part of it could be enclosed. Maybe there are water sprays at high level. We don't know this. It would be good to know in advance that this plant is not a significant source of dust. Um, and if it turns out to be, it could be controlled readily rather than have to solve the problem once it has occurred. So to summarize, we do appreciate that this operator provides a valuable service in recycling and supplying materials to the local construction industries. It provides employment and it supports the local economy. But the site's on our doorstep, and we are concerned that the wash plant will have a significant adverse effect on the immunity of our neighbours because of noise and dust emissions. And we believe the visual and the landscape impacts are not acceptable. Our fears about noise and dust might be allayed by the provision of further information, although our objection on visual and landscape grounds would remain. Although the application is for a period of 12 months, the wording of the application, and I think some of the comments you've heard from the officer today, and the scale and complexity of the plant and the groundworks that they put in to accommodate it, suggests that it's most unlikely to be a temporary installation. The cost of doing this for 12 months would seem to be disproportionate. So we believe that you should 
consider this application as if it were for permanent use, because that, I think, is the intention of the company. I therefore ask the committee, before making a decision on this application, they should ask officers to request further information on matters of noise and dust, and also, if I may venture this suggestion, if they haven't already done so, to visit the site to form their own judgment on the visual impact of the wash plant and its effect on the local landscape. Thank you, councillors, for listening. Thank you, Councillor Davis, for your comments. Um, I will now ask members whether they have any, any questions that they wish to put to you. Uh, as far as your comments are concerned, um, I'm sure some of them may be addressed by the uh, next deputy who's speaking on behalf of the applicant. And of course, we can also refer the points you've raised to the officers in a moment or two. So who's got questions of Councillor Davis? I can see some hands coming up now. We've got Councillor Gibson followed by Councillor Philpott. Yeah, OK, Councillor Gibson. Um, yeah, good morning. Um, I, I was actually the County Councillor in 2012, and uh, obviously I know uh, uh, Bob Davis well. Um, the um, I'm a bit concerned about the presentation that Sam gave because you know, I look at this when I actually supported on appeal. That can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank yes, I'm, I'm the question to uh, Councillor Davis. Question to Councillor Davis is that um, uh, there were certain conditions uh, put on the uh, the site um, back in 2012, and there have been accusations that um, uh, the breaches of policies uh, 13 and 5. And um, one of the conditions was the four meters. At the moment, there's a building that's 9.2 meters, and that is affecting the environment. Is that right? The the visual environment, Bob. Um, yes, that is one of our one of our principal. Well, one of our we have concerns about noise and dust, which, as I say, might be allayed with additional information. Um, and our standing objection concerns the visual impact of that wash plant, which cannot be screened by the perimeter bones. Councillor Gibson, do you wish to raise any other questions of Councillor Davis? No, not at the moment. OK, thanks for that. Uh, Councillor Philpott. Thank you, Chairman. Just uh, making sure my hand was lowered because it caused major confusion. Uh, uh, Councillor Davis, thank you for your, uh, for your presentation. I've got a question for you uh, relating to this uh, wash uh, plant facility. The, the wash plant facility, uh, although it's not being used, I understand, at present, it is in situ. Uh, and uh, it is obviously, I imagine, well known to all of the people in the area, including the um, Micklemarsh and uh, Timsbury Parish Council that the inspector in 2012 limited the uh, plant to four metres on site. So when that plant at 9.2 metres arrived on site, did the, uh, did your, the Micklemarsh and, uh, Micklemarsh and uh, Timsbury Parish Council raise an objection or raise their concerns with, uh, with the Hampshire County Council Planning Authority at that time? Yes, yes, we did, Councillor. And what was the outcome? Thanks. Um, we, we received no acknowledgement. Um, I then, in fact, spoke with Councillor Roy Perry, who is our um, county councillor, um, who did have further discussions with the um, with the planners at Hampshire. But we received no acknowledgement. But the fact that we did object um, at that stage was recorded in your officer's report, which you will have seen today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions of the of, of Councillor Davis? Just got Councillor Huckstep, Chairman. Councillor Huckstep, thank you. Roger. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, and thank you, Councillor Davis, for your deputation. You're our eyes on the world, as it were, for this one. Um, can you tell me whether you believe that the boundary treatment for this site is currently in accordance with all extant conditions? Um, 
I'm not sure that the Bund Heights um, comply precisely or whether the planting has been fully um, installed as required by the um, conditions on the 2012 decision. Um, but uh, we don't want to nitpick on minor points about bund heights or stockpile heights. We're, we're not, we recognize that some of these things don't always go quite according to plan and there are practical considerations. But we, we, so we prefer to concentrate on the main issues. And in this case, the main issues in our mind are noise and landscape impacts and potentially dust. Thank you for that. I was, I was really seeking a datum of where we are with how the applicant has previously behaved in terms of complying with conditions. So well, it might be possible for the officers to clarify uh, later whether the boundary treatment as it stands now is actually in accordance with current conditions. So thank you for that response. Yeah, yeah. Could, could I say, Councillor, we have, because we, we couldn't work out from the information provided with the application, um, how many of the increases in bund heights, for example, um, were in fact work that should have already been done in the terms of the 2012 <coughs> decision. Um, and we did ask that the officers should investigate um, whether everything in fact had been done in accordance with that permission. Um, I don't know whether that's been done or not. There is some, there is some doubt, shall we say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're happy with that, Roger? Yeah. Okay. Yes, I'm happy, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Uh, we I, I might think some further clarification from the officers later. I, I think somewhere in the report, it does mention the fact that there have not been uh, a number of complaints about the operation of this site over the last eight years. I, I think that somewhere in that report, it does say that. Um, can we then, if we have dealt with Councillor Davis, can we then move on to Mr. John Palmer, who is making a deputation on behalf of the applicant and Mr. Palmer, you will have heard of the objections and the points raised by Mr. Davis with particular regard to visual issues, noise and dust. Perhaps you could, in your deputation, uh, address those matters in particular to the committee. Hi, Peter, Chair. Um, thank you. Just checking, you can hear me? Yeah. OK, excellent. Yeah, I will um, I will come on to those points um, further down on my um, on my deputation. Yeah. Okay. Um, they are a key part of it, obviously. And I think I think Bob actually raises some good points as well. And I, I, think I thank him for his deputation today. Um, OK, so I think from the outset, it's it's important to reiterate that this site is a safeguarded, established, permanent <coughs> aggregate recycling facility which is authorised to handle 150,000 tonnes of waste and therefore is intended to contribute to a steady supply of aggregate for Hampshire and the surrounding area. Um, members should also be aware that the southwestern part of the site where the wash plant will be sited or is sited has planning permission for a campaign activity as allowed by condition 10 of the original appeal decision. Now, the original appeal decision references a foam mixing plant or wood shredding operation, yet not a wash plant operation. Hence why a variation to condition 10, as well as aligning the associated conditions is being sought to accommodate this specific operation the applicant is seeking to try out on site. So the existing unprocessed material is where the problem is. Um, what Sam didn't mention in his presentation is that the stockpile heights are some 10 to 14 metres in height, which is having a detrimental impact on the surrounding area. There's no hiding in that. They can't recycle it because of the kit on site at the moment is inadequate. Um, the applicant will effectively be able to produce higher quality aggregates with the introduction of the wash plant. This is what the whole need is for this application, to bring those stockpile heights down and to make the site better. Um, 
the sort of products range from 10, 20, 40 millimeter, 40 millimeter stone to two millimeter sand and five millimeter sharp sand. These are valuable aggregates for the local building industry in Hampshire, which which really need to be given a lot of weight in this decision making, I think, because um, you, you either have really high quality aggregates or you have a, a pile of effectively unprocessed material, which is just going to stay there due to the fact that there's no landfills in Hampshire anymore. So it's just impossible. It's impossible to get rid of this waste, which is coming in day after day after day. And in wet conditions, it's just virtually impossible to screen the material. So um, moving on to Bob's points he makes, um, which I welcome. Um, in respect to visual impact, I think we recognise the uppermost part of the wash plant protrudes slightly above the site's periphery buns, um, evidently by the photos which have been taken, which I'm not exactly sure where they were taken from, which I think is important. Um, you know, I, I recognise that, that the vegetation provides um, a greater degree of screening while in leaf. Um, it's not wholly devoid of any screen value, though, during the winter months with the branches serving to filter views. In fact, dense plantings such as hedgerow and scrub belts actually have very limited variance in the level of screening across the seasons due to the branched habit of the plants that they are comprised of. So in this case, the combination of existing trees and scrub species present um, on the western bund, along with the proposed conditional requirement to plant additional native trees at regular intervals, is intended to create a dense, denser belt of vegetation that will form an effective all year round screen. Furthermore, um, again, which wasn't mentioned, I don't think, in the officer's report, um, which was provided as additional information, um, <coughs> we intend to introduce a feathered stock of 2.5 metres height in planting on <coughs> that western boundary. This will be introduced immediately this December, and they have contractors, I believe, lined up to undertake this planting work. Um, this will obviously help enhance the level of screening immediately um, and, and to obviously address the fears raised by Bob in his deputation. Um, the new trees will be carefully planted by an appointed contractor um, at regular intervals among the existing vegetation to effectively bolster the level of screening um, already there. So moving on to noise, um, I acknowledge the concerns raised by Bob here in respect to the potential noise being generated from the wash plant. However, the EHO, as stated in paragraph 63 of the officer's report before you, <coughs> has not taken any issue with this and was evidently happy with the safeguards already in place, controlled by condition 8, which sets a rating level of noise emitted from the site, not exceeding 40 dB at any existing dwelling on the Casper Farm Fields Development and Cranford Farm at any time. So it should be noted that SLR at any point, that's my company I work for, but not asked to provide a noise assessment at any time during the determination period by the Office of Dealing with the application HCC. Um, the introduction of the wash plant will continue to comply with this limit, as will the other associated operations at the site, bearing in mind they've had a crusher and screener up there for literally years and there hasn't been any noise complaints and a wash plant is notoriously quiet. Um, Members should be aware, if you want to talk with details about the wash plant, the noisiest area of a wash plant is at the feed hopper, where essentially material gets brought into, um, into the wash plant, as shown on, the, I think it's the northern end of the schematic, and that sits comfortably below the four metres level of the bund. Um, and furthermore, the tonality generated from the wash plant is not tonal in nature, nor is it impulsive in nature, which are two key points which make the wash plant a quiet facility. Um, the applicant has advised that operating at maximum capacity, the feed hopper would be filled approximately 15 times within a normal hour, and each loading process would take approximately 20 seconds. So effectively, the hopper will have an on time of 12%, so five minutes in a normal <coughs> hour. All the other areas of the wash plant, if you like, the quieter areas, would operate continuously throughout a normal hour, with the only other activity being the loading shovel, which would operate adjacent to the wash plant and load materials into the hopper. Given the main source of noise generated by the wash plant, it's the feed hopper, which is below four metres and the nearest residential property, which is actually Bunny Lane House, which is located 530 metres as the crow flies from the feed hopper. Um, and the additional screening proposed, noise generated from the site would not be a concern to local residents, would continue not to be a concern to local residents, and, continu and a continuation of condition eight will continue to be complied with as it has been. 
So the other concern, I think, from Bob was dust. Um, I know he didn't go into it in detail, but um, I think it's important to be aware that um, wash plants are wet facilities. So this means that dust emissions are unlikely at the feed. And then once the material reaches the plant, the wet process not only suppresses the finer particles that would be considered dust, but it washes them through and they become the silts that in turn sent to the press which produces a cake which results in any possible dust being encapsulated in the cake and therefore That's one being minute remaining prevented from escaping to atmosphere so in summary thank you katie the benefits of allowing the wash plant to lawfully operate at the site include a higher aggregate and sand to be produced for the local building trade this is a popular site you you recall um, and it employs many people um, the recycled aggregate produced through the wash plant is clean and graded to a quality assured level that can be used for all types of building applications, including concrete manufacture. With wash plants, there is also significantly less waste than with a conventional system. All of the materials recyclable, with the exception of a very small element of light contaminants. Um, developers nowadays are looking to maximise the level of recycled materials they use in their projects because that gives them a higher environmental rating. So in conclusion, this really is an excellent opportunity to change the site for the better by providing enhanced screening, reducing the stockpile heights and supporting local economic growth by maintaining an efficient supply of recycled and secondary aggregates to the local building industry. Um, that's it from me. Um, I'm happy to take any questions you may have at this time and just wishing everyone obviously a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Thank you, Mr. Palmer, for that clear death deputation. Uh, I think I can see Councillor Philpott's on screen with a question. Um, Councillor Philpott. Yes, uh, thank, thank you, Chairman. And uh, is question for Mr. A couple of questions for Mr. Palmer, if I may, if uh, where to start from this. First, can I ask Mr. Palmer, first off, the, uh, the buns. Mm -hmm. the, the intention is to uh, raise the height of the buns, is it not? So the intention is to raise the height of the northeastern bund because of the excess of material which is sited to the west of the bund, which is incredibly higher than the bund itself. So effectively, the bund at the moment is here, which is four metres, and the material is up here. So by using the material, um, from this stockpile, which can't be recycled anymore because it's so wet, it will be effectively put into this bun to level out the site and protect views in. And then the material they can use will be put through the wash plant and then used as secondary aggregate recycling. I understood. So that's a yes then? Yes. Okay. Uh, so in raising the height of the bun, you're also going to be raising the uh, the width of the bun. That's correct, isn't it? Up to a, a minimum of nine metres. Is that right? No, that's incorrect. The, the width incorrect. of the bun is... Um, I believe it's five metres. What, what bund are we talking so about? You're raising, you're right, well, the, the material bund is going yeah. to be raised, is, the height is going to be raised, notwithstanding yes, yes. the vector. Sorry, I misunderstood. Yes, so the yes. material uh, bund is, is, is raised in height. Uh, you're suggesting to me that it, you're going to avoid uh, uh, an increase in width. No, no, it's it, it would be it's going it would to be, be wider space, isn't yeah, it? Yes, yes. I mean, at the moment, it's like that, and then it would be getting larger like that, effectively. Yeah. Yes. So it's going to be bigger, and uh, it's going to be it's going to be taller, and it's going to be wider, broader. Yep. I'll put it that. Way. Is it going to encroach on any other uh, any land? Anybody no. else's land? No, there's an existing fence in the northeastern part of the site, which denotes between the footpath um, and the site itself. Okay. And if you look on the schematics, it shows that in place. So, so, so it's a no, so it's not going to encroach on other people's land. OK, so if it's not encroaching on other people's land, have you factored in the loss of, uh, of space on site that this additional uh, bund is going to, to take into consideration, bearing in mind that you're already, as you as you were saying, stockpiling material much higher than than permitted under the uh, under the conditions. So. Yeah. Yes, we have. Yeah. All right. So the idea is to use some of that material on the bund, isn't it? That, that's exactly right. Yeah. Is the stuff which can't be can't be recycled anymore because it's just been there for so long. It's just it's worthless. And it's I, just... I, 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 I don't want the chairman to tell me off. So I've got to try and move on as quickly as I possibly can on this. Sure. Can I ask you, therefore, about the wash uh, uh, um, wash facility, the yes. uh, wash plant facility? Um, it's been established that that's 9.2 metres in height. 
And it's also been established that, uh, that the inspector in the 2012 report uh, said that one of the conditions was that no plant on site be uh, over <coughs> four metres in height. Yep. So uh, you have already, have you not installed or you're, you're, uh, on behalf, you're on behalf of the applicant, the applicant has already installed this 9.2 metre facility, although not, being, not using it at the present time. Can you tell us why, why did they do that? Why did they uh, install a 9.2 metre high facility on a site when they knew that the restriction was four metres? OK, so I'll, I'll do it in reverse. There, there is a condition 24 on the on the committee pack, which which allows for the new condition, allows for the temporary um, introduction of the wash plant at a higher height than the four metres, up to nine metres. So I think condition 24 is important. Um, in terms of why they've already brought this in, um, th there's a long leading time um, to getting a wash plant installed. Um, the people who they, I believe, rent in the wash plant off for a year, so we've got a contract with, um, they've got many different components to it. Um, some come from Italy, some come from Ireland, uh, I believe some even come from Portugal. So it's essentially getting everything shipped in into place um, was going to take six months uh, in itself. And I believe, you know, it's it's still not fully installed at the moment um, in terms of all the te te technical bits. Um, it, it's also worth bearing in mind that there's a regulatory process with a wash plant um, where SLI and my company um, are we've been appointed by the applicant to undertake a water interest survey, um, a pump test um, in order to get the abstraction license um, to allow for a private borehole, which I think Sam mentioned in the in the uh, deputation um, to the site to make it run as efficiently as possible. Um, so th there's just a long lead in time. So, it, I mean, Sam acknowledged in his report that it, it was at their risk, basically, and um, you know, that's it's a question for them as well to answer, but I can only answer from what I've been untold. So does, is that is that OK, Mr. Philpott? Uh, I'm not entirely sure it is OK, no. Well, obviously uh, it's not OK. I'll, I'll, let other members, I'll, I'll let other members make up their own mind uh, yeah. on, on, on all of that. So um, the issue then is that this plant, so my last question, that this wash plant facility has been hired for 12 yes. months. Yep. But uh, there are other components that, uh, that to bring in something of that size. Presumably it's on a hard standing of some sort that there are some form of tanks underneath or some form of, uh, of, of excavation or, or something of that sort that's been required to put this plant in place. So it's, uh, it's not a question of just hiring this facility, putting it in place and taking it away, or, or is that, or is, have, I, have I got that wrong? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, so it's on, it's situated on a concrete asphalt pad um, to ensure that no water seeps to the ground. Um, it's got three tanks underneath to the west, which I think are on the schematic, um, where all the water is collected, which it all runs off into. Um, so it's been fully installed appropriately um, by professional contractors. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman, for your patience. Just, thank thank you. I, I just, I just, I, I realise there are other members who want to come in and ask questions, so I shall, I shall stop there. Thank you so much. Thanks, Councillor Philip. Uh, Councillor, Councillor Quantrill. I think Councillor Mark Cooper was first, Chairman. Oh, he may sorry. have the same question yeah, as sorry, I have. Yeah. Uh, th thank you, Chairman, and uh, thank you, Councillor Quantrill. Um, I have three questions uh, for Mr. Palmer. Um, the first is, bearing in mind that the extant permission is four metres high stockpiles, why has your uh, client been bringing stuff onto site knowing that he can't process it and, and knowing that it has to go into uh, piles which exceed the planning permission? That's the first question. Mm -hmm. um, the second question is, uh, are you aware of the photographs that I've, I've, I've been sent uh, done by the neighbour to the site showing the existing uh, bund to the west of the site breached uh, and with slurry flowing out onto the neighbour's land. Um, and that obviously therefore raises the question about the uh, management capabilities uh, on, on this particular site. And my third question is, um, this installation is permanent, isn't it? Thank you. 
Okay, I think I've, I think I wrote all them down, Mr. Cooper. Um, so stock, stockpiles, why are they keeping on bringing on in material? I mean, obviously they have contracts with the local builders. Um, um, they are doing their absolute best to bring these um, stockpiles down. And in a recent email from Hampshire Enforcement, um, they recognise this, that they have actually dropped in height in the last year. But obviously it's been a very wet year and it sort of goes back to my original um, answer really. Of they just don't have the infrastructure on site to handle the popularity of the material being brought into the site. So they, as soon as it comes in, they, they, they just can't screen it quick enough. And if with the weather as well, it's just virtually impossible. So they've just come up with, they've ba they basically arrived at this situation where they just can't do anything else. So it's sort of a, a last grasp effort, if you like, to bring this wash plant in to sort out the stockpile issue because of the popularity of the site, essentially. Um, in terms of question two, the slurry flowing out, slurry flowing out of the site, I've been recently made aware of this, and I believe Sam's introduced a condition mm -hmm. as well, yeah. um, which was on the um, updated report, um, which will deal yeah. with this, and we will look to investigate this further, and and look to um, provide a scheme which will prevent prevent this happening in the future. Um, obviously, we have an hydrologist and hydrogeologist up there at the moment um, who's in talks with the Environment Agency with regard to the borehole. So it's something that we could definitely investigate further. And I think, if anything, um, that condition being introduced to the scheme will further help um, regularise the site further, because at the moment there isn't a condition, I believe, which prevents that. Um, and question three, is it permanent? Um, it's a trial run. They've got it for a year. If it doesn't work out, if they can't produce stockpile heights going down and it's not making, you know, progress the way they want it to, it, it can be removed and, and it will be removed. And the condition 24 will enforce that. But I did, I do think, I think I've made a point in my deputation as well, that um, any permanent facility or, or any permanent permanency of this facility um, would be would, would need to go through you know another sort of um, committee really to show how we've changed and updated everything to improve um, to improve the site um, to allow for the permanent retention of it so you know I think this is a, a trial run to sort out a big issue uh, I really urge members to get behind it and, and, and give it a go, um, basically. So I, I hope that answers your three questions adequately. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Keeper. Councillor Quantra, your, your hand's still up. Thank you. Yes, I, I still have the question of Mr. Palmer. Um, right. If permission was granted today, how soon would the stockpile heights, which are currently 10 to 14 metres, reduced to the permitted levels? That's a good question. And I think we Give could even... a good answer. <laughs> I think we could even add in, potentially, I don't know if this is possible, we'd have to check with the officers, um, uh, a, a condition which regulates it. So we provide feedback every month um, showing the, the stockpiles going down. And obviously, I think it would be, it would be expediated by the fact that the wash plant would be on site um, and, and it would effectively allow for a, a more efficient operation. So I'd imagine those stockpiles would be coming down at a much quicker rate had the, if the stock, if the wash plant wasn't there at all, if they were just using an old fashioned McCluskey screener, mm. which just doesn't, which doesn't work in wet weather. So, and, I think, I, I Chairman, think, may I ask Mr. Palmer just to answer the question, how soon would stockpile heights reduce to the permitted levels? So as soon as possible. And four meters. Less than twelve months. I don't. I don't run the plants. I don't. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I don't. I don't think, okay. Um, thank you. No, that's, I think that's if, great. If you, thank if, you, Mr. Palmer. I, I think. Okay. Yeah. No. And I'm, I'm just probing whether the stockpile heights would be reduced before the end of the trial period. So yes. I'm, I've been impressed by the detail you've given me, Mr. Palmer, and yep. and uh, that that's the nature of my question. So I, I've got the answer, Chairman, and, okay. and thank you, Mr. Palmer. Thank you, Councillor. Mr. Palmer, can I just ask you a question? Yes, please. Uh, you, you, you currently operate under an environmental permit. Yes. How would, and presumably if planning permission were granted, 
and the wash plant were allowed to be used, albeit on a temporary basis for up to 12 months, mm -hmm. what would the environmental health permit um, do to check on the wash plant? And would the environmental permit have any effect on noise and emissions, uh, that type of thing as well, yep. because those are concerns which have been raised by Mr. Davis. Yep, definitely. Um, so we've we've been instructed as well um, to prepare a revised um, permit for the site, um, which brings the site up to speed with having a wash plant on it. Um, that's in process at the moment with the Environment Agency. Um, subsequent to this um, committee, I can provide you with the references required. And obviously, yes, in, in that permit, there's noise, dust, uh, odour, etc. details, um, which the Environment Agency are currently currently looking at. Uh, and so is it the case then that uh, the wash plant couldn't operate until you've got the updated environmental permit? Um, yes, I believe so, yes. Thank you for that. Uh, are uh, there any other hands? Uh, yes. On this particular, uh, for Mr. Palmer. We have Councillor Bolton, Chairman. Councillor Bolton. Right. Councillor Bolton. Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, question for Mr. Palmer concerning the wash machine. Yes. And I apologise for my lack of knowledge, but you mentioned about the waste water going into tanks. So then what happens to the waste water and also the detritus as a result of the washing process? It's Thank a good you. question. Um, so there's, there's three concealed tanks underground. So any water coming off the wash plant in terms of um, rainwater or any water produced from the wash plant itself, um, will be collected in those tanks and then in those tanks that water gets pumped back into the wash plant. So it's, a, it's sort of a, a cycle, if you like, a water cycle, which, which allows for 100% recycling of any water collected on that pad, which is a really good system. It's a, it's a high end system. You, you can very high spec. Um, it's, it's not not cheap stuff. This it's you know, it's, it's good. Um, but does that does that sort of give you further sort of explanatory well, there was a second part to my question. What happens to the detritus? The, the detritus, stuff, do you mean the cake mixture? Yeah, the stuff that's washed out from the aggregate. So in the cleaning process. So does that, that, gets, that gets stockpiled and then sent away, basically. It's a very, very small amount of cake which gets produced there. You're looking at 6% or something like that. It's you know, it's one trip a week, I think, in terms of getting rid of that detritus. Um, I'll leave it at that. I, I, I feel uneasy hmm. about the installation of this washing machine, wash facility. You say it's only for a temporary 12 month period. That's all the but, planning permission would allow for. Yes. But approaching the end of the 12 months period or shortly after, I know what the applicant, I, I suspect what the applicant may then seek to do. Which that's not for to, today. Sorry, Chairman? I don't think that's an issue to, to be. No, I understand to, that, Chairman. Um, I'll leave it at that. OK, thank you, Councillor. Thanks, Ray. Um, do we have any further questions of the two deputies? We've got Councillor Huckstep, Chairman. Uh, Roger. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, yes, um, a question for Mr Palmer, if I may. Uh, was there any consideration of designing a wash plant that did not exceed the height restrictions? I am not familiar with the engineering of uh, these wash plant yeah. facilities but uh, a design that could have complied uh, with the height restrictions <coughs> might have been uh, a more favourable option. Yes, um, it, the issue is wash plants in nature are notoriously high due to the way they work. So anything below sort of seven, nine metres is, is, 
is unheard of for a wash plant. So it's just the way the whole um, the whole the whole the way the whole machine works. Unfortunately, it, it, it has to be high. Um, the way that the feed hopper starts, you know, using the waste through and then going into the components, it's you know, it's unfortunately the only other option which we did consider was digging down below the site and then it would drop it significantly, which is something which could potentially be done further down the line in terms of any permanent application as improving it, subject to obviously stockpiles coming down and and, and everything else being working working well. So to answer your question, it, it we're kind of stuck with the technology really, we, you know, apart from digging down, which would require further assessments, which we didn't really want to do. Given, right. given it's in a groundwater protection zone and stuff like that, source protection zone. I think that answers your question, Roger, as best as it can. I have the picture. Thank you. Thanks. Um, right. Any further questions of Mr. Palmer or Mr. Davis? Right. So the deputies, you play no further part in this discussion. Um, but you're welcome to stay on if you wish to do so. Members, do you have any questions now of Sam Dumbrell in relation to his presentation? Councillor Andrew. And then Councillor Cooper. Can you bring your microphone, please, down, Councillor Gibson, on your headset? It's up. If you, your microphone on your headset. Can you it's just up. That's better. Thank you. Yeah. I've taken off the headset. I'm still not used to using them very well. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, the, they had the boundary changes, so I'm no longer the county councillor, but I was before. Um, you know, the... I know that uh, Bob Davis is very, very organised and... Um, you know, he complained about the height of the um, the wash uh, uh, installation, and um, I just wonder, Sam, why you haven't done anything about that, and why has nothing's been done about it? The second question is that how on earth can um, can you convince me that this is a, a temporary installation? They've spent m maybe even a million on uh, putting in the uh, the foundations, putting in the tanks underneath. Um, hiring the equipment, I'd like to see that uh, it was a rental agreement because I'd be very surprised. <laughs> I think this is a permanent uh, installation which is being presented to us. And um, I'd just like to, to understand from you why you're trying to present it as a, a temporary and, and why you're accepting 9.2 metres when we uh, limited them to four. Andrew. Uh... Um, I'm not sure Sam can do, do anything more than the report indicates that the application is for 12 months and that is what and we have to assume that that is the case and that the, his report has been presented on that basis. I think your first point was why nothing's been done with regard to enforcement. I think probably that was because the officers knew that the application was coming forward anyway, so they were they would leave it to determination for the day. But if it were refused, then I think questions of enforcement would arise. Would be my answer to your two I'll, questions. OK, I'll, I'll just add something to that, Mr Chairman, if, you, Sorry, if I yes, may. Sir. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Councillor Gibson, in terms of your first uh, comment about Mr Davis. Uh, we did, I did receive uh, correspondence initially from Mr Davis when the application first went out on raising a number of concerns and my my response to him initially on that was to uh, you know, please you know, please put those concerns into your consultation response uh, because obviously that's the way planning works initially and then we, you know then we review all the responses and we did end up going back to the applicant to get uh, a considerable amount of further information. Uh, in terms of uh, Mr. Davis's criticisms, that I think beyond that, he they were not getting a response from us. I firstly could could agree that uh, 
maybe communication could be improved. But I would add that there was communication initially and perhaps it wasn't as as clear as it could have been or perhaps not the or and or, or not the answers that Mr Davis wanted at the time. There have been other residents who've come to us as well, uh, namely the adjacent landowner and, uh, and another person who lives fairly nearby. And ever since uh, Mr Davis raised his concerns via Councillor Perry, uh, myself and the enforcement team have been have been uh, you know, visiting the site regularly, liaising with those complainants, dealing with the allegations and investigating that as the applications continued. And, uh, I, and again, I know uh, Mr Palmer can't confirm that now, but he would be able to confirm that because we've been raising those issues with him as well. Uh, and, and regarding your second point uh, about it being temporary or permanent, uh, the, the applicant has applied for a temporary planning permission and again if it's permitted today it would be a temporary planning permission only and that is entirely at the applicant's own risk if at the end of that period uh, the, the 12 months we we would go back to them and say right you know you need to be removing it restoring it if they don't do that then enforcement acts out immediately uh, because it would be a you know, breach of, they wouldn't you know, be, or not only would it be a breach, it would be unauthorised development uh, because the, the 12 months, the 12 months have lapsed. Uh, and, and I think uh, count, uh, the chairman also mentioned that and he also added that, you know, whilst the application was being, was heading for a determination, uh, for us to have started issuing uh, you know, formal enforcement notices when, you know, we were sort of, you know, six, six, four weeks away from committee, wouldn't have been helpful, especially as there was uh, there was no sort of defined harm being caused. So uh, it's not it's not it's not only really you know it's not totally satisfactory for everyone, but that's the sort of position we are in when we knew we were heading for this December date. Okay, Andrew. Uh, I think Councillor Coop. Yeah. Councillor Cooper. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, a couple of questions for Sam. Um, the first is, Sam, you've got a, an unusual number of additional conditions on the update sheet, uh, as though they're, they're rather like afterthoughts. Um, the key one is that the, the approved operational drainage system has to be implemented in full. Uh, obviously, what's the deadline for that? Because obviously we, we can't have that implementation um, and then have the plant operating. You, the things are conditioned on the other. So is there a deadline for that? Uh, and the other thing is, I, I don't see any sign of the uh, ecological mitigation strategy, which you refer to in the main body of your report. Um, has that been done? Uh, and will that be done again before you issue uh, a temporary permission, if that's what the committee decision happens to be? In other words, there's a lot of work to be done here because of your additional conditions. Um, how long is it going to be before all those mitigations uh, are, are, are cleared and done and completed? Uh, thank you, Councillor Cooper. In terms of uh, the comment about the uh, number of updated conditions, uh, yeah, it's, there are, there are probably more than more than is normal, and I apologise for that. Uh, a number of them were uh, they were they weren't material, you know, significant changes for the ones that were amended. They were a couple of them were just updating to better wording. And whilst I wouldn't want to criticise a planning inspector. Uh, some of the conditions that were imposed did need tightening up, especially as we've moved on sort of several years. Uh, specifically, conditions uh, 20 and uh, so just looking at others. Yeah, condition, condition 13, because we've moved on in terms of drainage, drainage approvals and drain schemes on site, you're operating on site as well. Uh, and, and again, that works with condition 12 too, the oil storage you know, fuel containment condition. Uh, you know, the, those three conditions, you know, we've moved on in terms of sort of uh, uh, environmental best practice. Uh, in terms of the condition 24, which again, you asked another question about in terms of sort of guaranteeing, guaranteeing, you know, how, how do we enforce that use? The reason for the rewording, uh, to use the words becoming operational was because the term use was, was a sli was slightly vague, and you know my my enforcement colleagues sort of commented on that. 
what what we what we don't want to happen here, and I'm not saying it would if permission was granted, is that the plant could be uh, go through a testing or a commissioning phase, and then that uh, run for a you know what we don't want to do is what we wouldn't want is a, is an applicant to keep coming back to saying well, we haven't if you haven't started using it yet we're still commissioning it. So the reason for the updated wording was you know, becoming operational. So the day it starts having material put through it, that's when it becomes operational. Uh, and again, I'm not I'm not caught trying to cause uh, create uh, uh, any negative views of the applicant here. Uh, mm. But you know, but what we don't want is a uh, you know 12 months operation to become 15 months to become 18 months. You know, we say well we're still testing it, we're still testing it. It's, it's a 12 month period they've applied for, and that, it'll be a 12 month period they get. Right. Can I have just one more question, Chairman? And yeah. in terms of the yeah. ecology comments. Yeah. I, I was just going to answer your question about the ecological uh, mitigation. Uh, again, as I mentioned in the report, there are a number of uh, approved schemes or, uh, already implemented, or some some have been established and uh, put you know put into place. Some are still being. Uh, implemented condition. So I'm just looking, trying to refer you to the report. Uh, referring you to condition two. No, sorry, apologies. Condition. So I'm just trying to find the right one. I thought it was within. So I'm just trying to find the right one. Uh, I'm, it's at the end of the conditions. It is number. Number two, condition 20, proposed condition 22. Uh, condition 23 is relevant as well. But in, if we draw attention to condition 22, uh, that acknowledges the uh, ecological mitigation scheme approved and implemented under through the and to supplement that in accordance with our county ecologists' requirements. We've got those three bullet points. Uh, and again, that would have to be supplied uh, not later than one month following the grant and planning permission, but prior to the commencement of all works, all works being the the bun, you know peripheral bunding works, uh, because the wash plant obviously is already in situ, uh, but again that wouldn't be having an impact on the <coughs> on the flora and fauna that the the ecologist was worried about now and that was uh, relevant back in when the appeal decision was granted. It's specifically related to sort of the, the planting and the underplanting and the species types on the peripheral bunding, uh, you know, mainly on the western, western and southern sides. But of course, it would be relevant to the changes to the northern and eastern bunding as well. All right. Thank you, Councillor Huckstep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Sam, just a quick one. Uh, can you confirm, uh, given my earlier questioning of uh, Councillor Davis? Uh, whether or not the boundary treatment complies with extant conditions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, my, one of my colleagues, uh, well, uh, my manager Chris Murray might have a comment as well. Uh, my, my, uh, my, my lead enforcement officer, David Smith, uh, is listen is in on the discussion too. But I would just add initially, uh, I'm going to draw your attention to the proposed conditions again, and I'm just finding the right one or ones. Uh, so you've got condition four, which uh, is the uh, first to the approved landscape uh, landscaping works mitigation that was formed part of the appeal. And again, if, if this was approved today, that, that would ensure that the, uh, the the appropriate species of trees and shrubs, sea planting, uh, 
you know, appropriate soil ground preparation would be, and a long term maintenance, maintenance management plan would be, would yeah, be conditioned so, going forward. Sorry to, interrupt, the years. Sorry to oh, interrupt you, Sam, but I, I'm interested in what the situation is now, not yeah, yeah. what conditions will apply in the future. Are, uh, is, the, is the applicant fully up to date with extant conditions addressing the, the state of the boundary condition uh, of the boundary treatment? Okay, well, I might prefer to Chris Murray or David Smith for in, in terms of the monitoring update, if that's okay. Yep, that's fine, Sam. Mr. Chairman. Chris, do you want to come in on that? Well, Chairman, I, I, I can't say for definite that what is there today is in accordance with the, with the conditions. Um, whether um, David, through our monitoring process, can say for definite, I think the bond heights appear to be correct. The element where I think there would be some doubt is whether all the planting to those bonds has taken place. That's what I, that's what I can't say from my own experience, whether David could uh, clarify that for us, uh, if he's able to. Uh, I am able to clarify that the planting that was required was initially undertaken. Um, obviously, over the intervening years, I can't comment on the standard, uh, the state of, or the standard rather, of maintenance of that planting and whether it has been um, properly kept up, so to speak. So the planting was undertaken, but I, I wouldn't like to comment on the state, the standard of maintenance in the intervening years <laughs> and how much of that planting has survived or has thrived, shall we say. I don't Chairman, think you're going to get a clear answer on that one, Roger. Chairman, it might be worth me just saying that obviously uh, it varies from site to site, the level of proactive monitoring that we do. And a lot of the monitoring, as you will appreciate, is done reactively, depending on um, the circumstances. We've only got limited resource. So it may well be, if it hasn't been brought to our attention, that the planting over the years has um, has not been you know, taken successfully and that it needs to be uh, redone, maintained, etc. And obviously that's something, if permission were granted here, that's something that could be um, looked at in more detail moving forward. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, do, do we have any further questions of Sam Dunmerill? It just comes no. from Quantrum. Sorry? Sorry, as you said, Chairman, yes, just Councillor Quantrill left. To yeah. ask um, sorry, my, my hand is raised because I'd like to invite the legal uh, officer to give us an opinion on a question I have. And my question is not for uh, Mr. Dumbrell. Right, OK. Um, your question then to Carolyn. Um, during the discussions and the questionings, we've heard comment on the installation of this um, plant in advance of a planning application and also there's some conjecture of what might happen after the period uh, for which we are being asked to consider the planning application. Should we disregard how we've arrived or how the client has arrived at this um, position and what might happen after this application expires? Should we be minded to agree it? Carolyn, do you want to... Thank you, uh, Councillor Control. Yes, I, I heard your question. Thank you, loud and clear. Um, in terms of retrospective applications, um, then you need to look at the applications that it currently stands at the moment, and it shouldn't take into consideration the fact that it is retrospective. It should just be categorised as a normal application. <laughs> um, and also, I... I one would assume, you know, if, if it's going to be there, if you're contemplating it being there for 12 months or longer, I mean, that, that the consideration is for the actual application as it stands for the temporary permission. Um, and you can't take that into consideration any for, you know, it, it's, it's only hearsay at the moment. It's not any substantive grounds at this point in time. Right. I think that then deals with questions of deputies and officers, and we now move into debate. 
Um, does anyone wish to kick this off with feelings one way or the other as to Grant? Councillor Cooper. Oh, I'd rather have they wouldn't be first, Chairman. Uh, well, should uh, I just... Councillor Cooper, do you want me just to say one or two words about it? Before, to give you a chance to at least think of what you're... No, no, to... I know, I know what I'm not... I, I, I do prepare my meetings, Chairman. OK, off you um, go. Well, one is tempted to say that if the appeal inspector back in 2012 uh, said condition two, uh, and then said we had to have condition nine, and then said we had to have condition uh, ten. And then along comes the applicant and wants to change those three conditions. My response is rather like a, a, a lady friend of ours, which was no, no, and no. Um, having said that, I, I do appreciate that it's, it's more subtle than that. I'd like members to appreciate that uh, although this area isn't sort of outstanding landscape, it is very much part of the structure of the of the test valley if you imagine that the test valley is a floodplain uh, and within the floodplain there are little valley plateaus which are built upon and so on and there are farms then there's a, a slight slope up onto the plateau gravels which is where all these minerals workings happen to be uh, and then you go beyond in, in towards the, the, the hampshire vernacular now basically this application is at the top of that plateau slope so as you approach it, it's right there in front of you. It's, it, it's, on, it's on a piece of high land, um, which is in relative terms to, to the valley floor. So it is rather prominent and it's very prominent for the nearby dwellings. Um, I know Sam says in his report 0.1 kilometres and 0.2 kilometres, but please bear in mind when you say 100 yards, 200 yards and 300 yards away, it doesn't seem quite so far away. Um, it is an area which is a source protection zone uh, of water. It is in an area which ultimately drains uh, down to the River Test, the, that precious jewel of Hampshire. And it, it, that the whole idea of having a bore uh, and then having a wash plant uh, concerns me. If the wash plant really is an integrated uh, wash plant, why do you need a borehole uh, to provide the water? Um, so presumably they're going to have to extract water from the ground. So where does the surplus water go? And the answer is it has to go to the drainage system and whatever the mitigation may be, that's going to have an impact on the river test. In addition, all the buns they're talking about are actually on the northeast side, the big high buns, where they want to store their material in effect. The actual buns on the west side, where you've got the view into the site, are ordinary uh, four meter high buns, if that. And the vegetation has not taken, and that's where after you would have thought eight years of permission, a screen would have grown up by now and would have been a satisfactory screen to this particular plant. <coughs> Therefore, I concur entirely with the Parish Council. Uh, and my own view is that notwithstanding the fact they've already installed the plant and everything else, that I'm most unhappy with the variation on the original inspector's uh, permission, and I'm going to be voting against. Thanks for that. Uh, Councillor Philpott, I can see. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I, I don't think I can be anywhere near as eloquent as Councillor Cooper, as always. I shall, I, I shall just do my best to make a contribution. You know, Councillor Hughes, when he's on these committees, uh, never uh, misses an opportunity <coughs> to uh, remind us um, of his phrase that there's nothing more permanent than temporary. So uh, with that in mind, um, I was giving this some consideration. Of course, I wasn't a member of this uh, committee uh, in 2011 when permission was refused for the site and it was approved on appeal. And I take the view that the inspector uh, imposed those conditions uh, in 2012 for a reason. Now, the applicant is perfectly entitled to seek a variation of conditions and uh, also as someone who's served on uh, on planning committees, uh, both at district and now at county level. Uh, I no longer get worked up when uh, when I see uh, see applicants come in with retrospective planning applications. However, when they do come in with retrospective planning applications, they are taking a risk and they need to be aware that they're taking a risk. And I believe the applicant in this case is aware of the risks that they were taking by putting the plant in place for the wash plant facility. 
and then subsequently seeking permission for it, albeit on a temporary basis. My conclusion, Chairman, having heard all of the evidence of this and read the reports thoroughly, is that I see no grounds to for this application uh, for the variation of the conditions to be accepted. In, and I believe that the application is contrary to policy five, and I believe also possibly policy 13 of the Hampshire Minerals and Waste Local Plan, <clears throat> and like Councillor Cooper, I intend to vote against. Thank you. Councillor Quantrill. Uh, thank you. It's a it's, um, complicated decision, this. It, in simplistic terms, in looking at the report of Mr Dumbrell, policy one, um, which we have, avoids the extraction of primary aggregates, so we comply with that. Policy seven um, means that it contributes to our adequate supply of aggregates as well. The interesting thing from Councillor Davis's presentation um, is that the bonds currently, uh, sorry, the stockpiles currently are 10 to 14 metres high. Um, and Mr Palmer for the applicant has confirmed that. So when we're looking at the issues of the plant being nine metres high, I think we're missing the point that the stockpiles are 10 to 14 metres high at present, and we're hearing they're unlikely to reduce without the washing plant being put in place. Um, and Mr. Um, or the officer's report later on in, in our agenda shows that on the 11th of May 2020, there was a paper um, positions recovering the strategy um, after COVID-19, whereby stockpiles at different sites around the county on the waste recycling sites were allowed variations. So in this last year, we've seen the stockpiles climb to 10 to 14 metres. Here we have the opportunity for 12 months only to see those stockpiles reduced and Councillor Davis would then, I'm sure, approve of them reducing to below the bund height of four metres. So I'm minded, because this is for 12 months only, to allow this application to be granted. And then, as Ms Strickland has said, um, it will come back before this committee, um, whether Councillor Hughes is on it or not, um, that will be the occurrence. And we can reconsider the situation again, having seen those stockpiles reduce from 10 to 14 metres to four metres. And I'm sure Councillor Davis would find that equally beneficial as well. So all in all, I might need to grant this application. Thank you, Councillor Quantrill. Councillor Huckster. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I'm drawn to uh, paragraph 52 in our sorry paragraph 53 in our papers it's on page 50 it's the national waste planning practice guidance and the relevant paragraph identifies three other paragraphs in that guidance now the descriptions of these paragraphs in the paper are not quite as they are in the reference uh, i don't need to go into the detail of all of that Para 47, the actual wording that should be in the parenthesis is should existing waste facilities be expanded or extended? The waste planning authority should not assume that because a particular area has hosted or hosts or waste disposal facilities that is appropriate to add to these or extend their life. It's important to consider the cumulative effect of previous waste disposal facilities on a community's well-being, impacts on environmental quality, social cohesion and inclusion, and economic potential. So I think that this particular application uh, really does not meet, I believe, the intent of 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 that paragraph uh, i therefore will be voting against the application does anyone else wish to speak on this 
I would perhaps like to summarize, put one or two points forward before we all, all reach a decision. And I suppose my starting point is policy one of the Hampshire Mineral and Waste Plan, which that we should take a positive approach to minerals and waste development that reflects a presumption in favor of sustainable development in the national planning policy framework. In looking at every application, we have to consider whether the, if it should be granted, whether or not the disadvantages of granting planning permission outweigh the advantages. We go back to 2011 uh, and this committee, when a similar application came forward, rejected the application, which the inspector reversed and granted the application. So the site has been in operation now since 2012 for eight years. This report um, indicates on the paragraph 114 that with the exception of complaints concerning the height of stockpiles exceeding their four meter maximum heights, there have been no substantial complaints concerning operational impacts from noise, air quality, or through vibration on the locality and local properties have been made. So there have been no complaints over the last eight years as to how this site has been run. It operates under an environmental permit. And if planning were granted, the operational, the environmental permit would have to be put in place in relation to the wash plant. Now, whatever happens today, whether we grant or not, the site will still be in operation from today onwards anyway. The application according which has the officer's support, the application was put in, in their words, in order to improve the position with regard to stockpile, in order to reduce the stockpiles, which would be um, reduced with the Come use the of... the O2 box. messaging service. The person you are calling is unable to take your call. Please leave your message after the tone. To re-record your message, key hash at any time. Sorry about that. I don't know whether that's on. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is that the purpose of the application is to reduce the stockpiles and thereby increase the height of the buns, which would help with regard to noise um, and visual impacts. We then come back to the wash plant. One can't argue with the fact that the wash plant is 9.2 meters high and the buns are four meters high. So there is going to be a visual impact for 12 months if planning granted, and we can't get away from that. The purpose of the wash plant is to facilitate the use of getting rid of the stockpiles and moving on the gravel aggregate so that what so that what is there can be moved on to other sites and sold. So that's the purpose of the wash plant and that you therefore have to go back to say is that more of more use would it be better for the wash plant to be there and tried out than to not have it um, do we accept the height which we can't uh, do anything about or do we say no to the to the application and take the risk of the fact that we would be going against officers advice and the fact that there have been no complaints about the operation of this site over the last eight years. Those are considerations which I think we should 
take into account before we vote. So that's the only comments I've got to make on the application. I don't know whether, Chris, you wish to add anything. Message deposited. Thank you for calling. Goodbye. Um, Chairman, thank you. I think that's that's a fair a fair summary. Um, I mean, what is clear here is that the proposal is um, is the introduction of a significant new element to this um, existing waste activity, uh, and we can't get away from that. It, it breaches the original permission, the conditions on the original permission. Hence, you've got the planning application in front of you today. But of course, circumstances change. The needs of various operations change. Uh, and we've heard the applicant's agent explain why um, why this this is needed now to manage the site better going forward. Um, the plant will clearly be seen. Um, I don't think there's any doubt about that. The plant will be seen, um, but that doesn't necessarily in itself make it unacceptable. Uh, you've got to look at that in the context of the value of the landscape, etc. Um, and the visual impact can be reduced. Uh, through through planting, but it won't be completely, you know, it won't be completely screened, clearly. Um, this is a difficult decision for you members. You don't need me to tell you that. It's one that's that's a balanced consideration. On balance, officers feel that the benefits that would would come from this development outweigh any de uh, disbenefits, hence the recommendation. You've seen the conditions that would be applied. The applicant has applied for one year only. Um, and so we have to deal with it on that basis uh, and it does give an opportunity for the impacts to be uh, re reconsidered in, in a year's time. Um, so on balance, uh, um, you, you've see, you can see what our recommendation is and I hope you can understand uh, the reasons that we've reached that conclusion. Um, those members that have got concerns, I think they do relate largely to the visual impact. Um, and you've got the policies in the plan there that, that would be relevant if that was something that was concerning members. Uh, I think other issues are probably not of great significance in terms of a, of a determination. Clearly water quality is important, but that can be managed by the environment agencies permit, and that would be very uh, rigidly controlled by them. And I think all other issues could, could be properly managed. I think it really is ultimately the impact that this uh, this large piece of plant would have on the landscape that would be, that would be the your main consideration, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, Carolyn, it, from a legal point of view, is there anything you wish to add? Uh, Chairman, there is nothing further that I need to add at wow. all. Thank you. Then I think we can move on to the to a vote on this and the. To, to the recommendation as to how and the recommendation if we're all ready is that planning permission be granted chairman sorry can i put in am i allowed to vote because i join it when the officer presenting the report no uh, no if you were you here right from the beginning of the of this application no when the officer was representing the uh, presenting the report uh, if you weren't here, Charles, right from the beginning. Okay, I don't fine. Think okay, you, you that's right. Okay, okay. No, please. Thank um, you. So we go to the um, recommendation is that planning permission be granted subject to the updated report, which we have discussed at length this morning, and the conditions listed in Appendix A. Katie, can you now take the uh, vote. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you for confirming, uh, Councillor Chowdhury, with your vote, um, and obviously with other members, if there is any reason why you haven't been able to be part of the whole discussion, then to abstain. <clears throat> so I'll go through alphabetically, um, and if you could just confirm whether you are for voting against or whether you are abstaining from the vote. So, Councillor Bolton? For, on the basis that in 12 months time, that the officers... Chairman, this is a vote, not a debate. Right, I'll abstain then. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Carter. 
for Councillor Mark Cooper. Against. Councillor Rod Cooper. Against. Councillor Gibson. I can I can just about ah uh, is that you, Councillor Gibson? Yeah. Sorry. I say, sorry, Councillor Gibson, could you repeat your, your vote? Yes, I will abstain. Thank you. Councillor House? Against. Councillor Huckstep? Against. Councillor Irish? Against. Councillor Latham? For. Uh, Councillor McAvoy has um, now left the meeting due to some internet issues, so I will mark her down as an abstention. Councillor Philpot. Against. Councillor Price. I'm against because I left the, the meeting for a couple of minutes during the, the first deputation. Thank you, Councillor Price. I'll put you down as an abstention. Uh, Councillor Quantrill. Four. Thank you. Um, I can confirm we have six members against the application, three in favour and four abstentions. So the, um, so the recommendation is refused. Thank you for that. So that concludes item seven. I think we could all do with a break. Um, so I'm going to have Chairman, a break now for 10 minutes. Chairman, if I may. Um, you've you voted. Oh, we've got to, to give reasons. Exactly. Yes, you voted to accept the recommendation, but we need a re reason for refusal from you, please. Well, uh, Mark Cooper, what are the reasons for refusal? Uh, yes, I, I haven't got my policy book with me here, Chairman, but um, it's basically the visual intrusion of the plant itself. It's not the, it's not the bonds issue, <coughs> it is purely the 9.2 metre plant, uh, which is so visible on the hill. So uh, it's, it's a landscape uh, and, and visual intrusion uh, uh, refusal from my, from my point of view. Welcome any other input. Chris, I don't think there can be any other in input. It re purely relates to that wash plant and, and its height. That's the whole issue. Chairman, sorry, can I, can I just add that during my summing up of this, I felt that the applicant, or the application is contrary to policies five and 13 of the Hampshire Minerals and Waste Local Plan. And, uh, uh, and I believe the wording of that is, uh, is, is fairly clear in terms, of, in terms of what it says. I have, I have some of it in front of me here. Um, there are certain reasons why policy five, for example, can be accepted. And uh, it says that uh, such, uh, uh, it would not be permitted unless, and there's five, uh, sorry, three considerations under policy five. Uh, that it's time limited mineral extraction, which I don't believe this is. Uh, B, the nature of the development is related to countryside activities, and I don't believe this is. And or C, that the development provides a suitable reuse of previously developed land, including redundant farm and forestry buildings and their, and their curtilages and hard standings. That's a matter of opinion, and in my opinion, it does <coughs> not. So, in my opinion, calculate policy five. Policy 13, uh, it speaks of uh, maintaining and enhancing the distinctive character of the landscape and, landscape and townscape. And I believe that this, uh, this application is contrary to policy 13 for that reason. So that my, those are my reasons, whether other members who voted against have other reasons, it's a matter of Caroline, do you have any comment on that? from a legal point of view, or Chris? Chairman, if, if I may, um, if we just go back to the refusal uh, originally, the, the yep. option was allowed on yep. uh, One of those reasons was the, um, the proposal would have a detrimental effect on the landscape character of the, of the area. Um, I would suggest that it's similar wording in this case, um, and it would be uh, 
and contrary to elements of policies 5, 10 and 13 of the Minerals and Waste Plan and potentially policies E1 and E3 of the Test Valley Borough Council Local Plan which also relates to um, landscape, visual impact etc. So um, I'm sort of um, paraphrasing slightly there but I, would you be comfortable with that, that approach that it would be um, detrimental, would have a detrimental in, in, impact uh, or effect on the landscape character of the area, notwithstanding the proposed mitigation in this case, uh, and that would, would be contrary to policies um, 5, 10 and 13 of the Hampshire Minerals and Waste Plan and policies E1 and E3 of the Test Valley, Test Valley Borough Council Local Plan. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm sure Mark and uh, Stephen will support that. So, yes, I have to say we, we, we agree. Uh, yes. Katie, do we need to take another vote on, on the reason? Uh, I, I doubt it. Uh, I, I think we can accept those as the reasons given. Yes, and a lot of those were captured of those as part of the debate. On voted against it. Okay. Thank you. I'm happy with that then, Chairman. Okay. So we'll, we'll have a 10 minute break. It's 10 to 1 now. So and we've got the major item to come up now. And so shall we come back at one o'clock? Delightful. Okay.
OK, we're back on again. OK, so uh, we, we move ever forward now to item number eight, uh, which is the application of the land at Three Maids Hill off the A272. I think we all know roughly where it is, A272 and the apex of a triangle between the A272 and the A34. So it's an, a new site uh, which is proposed there. And without any further ado, I'll ask Amy Dales to introduce the item. Amy, over to you. Thank you, Chairman, and good afternoon, members. Uh, I will just share my screen with you all so that you can see the presentation. Uh, could you all just let me know that that's definitely working? Yeah. Fabulous. OK, so as uh, Councillor Latham has already said, it's uh, an application for the development of an inert waste recycling facility at land at Three Maids Hill, which is just to the north of Winchester. So uh, this just shows some of the site context. So uh, we've got the site here um, located directly between the A272 here uh, and the A34 to the east side here. Um, in terms of uh, residential uh, nearby, there's Worthy Down uh, Village up towards the north here, Littleton down towards the southwest, and Kingsworthy over here to the eastern side. Um, a slightly closer view here allows us to see the nearest residential property, which is here at Three Maids Bungalow, which is approximately 160 metres southwest of the site. Um, and this bungalow, um, as I'm sure many of you will be aware, is uh, associated with Littleton Stud, um, which is the uh, farm that covers this whole area here, uh, the equestrian centre, sorry, that covers this whole area here to the southwest. Um, this is the second uh, closest residential amenity here at Lower Farm. Um, and as you can see, again, the A34 here are along the eastern boundary uh, and the A272 here on, along the western boundary. Um, the aerial view here helps to give an idea of some of the screening in the area. Um, so you can see it's quite quite well um, uh, woodlanded sort of to the western boundary here along both sides of the A272. Um, and again, more vegetation down here to the southwest uh, on the roundabout and on the southern boundary and eastern boundary of the site itself. Um, and just to make you all aware, there is also a that although there are no um, designated public rights of way, there is a permissive footpath that runs along uh, the side, the western side of the A272 here, where this woodland boundary is. So onto the site plan here. Um, this gives uh, the A272 here to the west, um, and this is the site access here. Um, you can just see these. Uh, hashed grey lines here denote mm -hmm. the um, raised acoustic bund which will be two metres high um, and they're planning to have one that runs all the way along uh, sort of the west, south and eastern boundary and then another one along the northern boundary. There's also um, additional planting proposed on top of this two metre acoustic bund, um, particularly around the western uh, side of the site which currently has slightly less screening than the rest of the site. Um, as you can see labelled here towards the south, you'll find the Three Maids Roundabout, which links the site to the A34. Um, the site plan also denotes the fact that the site will be a one way system. Um, so HGV vehicles will come in here and um, follow these arrows down. Oh, sorry. Follow these arrows uh, down to the, the bays here uh, and follow it around and back out again down to the three maids roundabout and the A34. Um, you can also see the topsoil barn here, um, which is the, the highest uh, building that they're proposing on site being seven metres tall. Um, and that has been placed along the eastern boundary, both due to the level of screening uh, next to the A34. And as you can see, there is further planting proposed there. Uh, and also because of the topography of the site, which I think you can see in our next slide. Yeah, so this is our elevation here. This is the topsoil barn, um, which has been placed uh, 
at the, sl the furthest sloping end of the site to minimise its impact. Um, I believe it's 4.5 metres lower at this end of the site than at this end of the site. Um, this cross section also helps to give an indication of the acoustic buns uh, and the planting in relation to the, the current surroundings. So uh, this planting here obviously already exists uh, and this is along the western side of the A272 uh, and this is where you see the permissive footpath um, through these trees. Then we've got the A272 uh, and this red line indicates the two metre high acoustic bund and then uh, an indication of the planting um, on the top of there. We've then got an indication of the, the size of the aggregate bays uh, where the material will, will be stored, um, the main operational area in the centre of the site, which I believe is also where the small concrete pressure will go, um, the topsoil barn, uh, and again, another uh, indication of the acoustic bonding planting on the uh, A34 eastern side of the boundary there. Um, some photographs now, um, just to give you a, a, an idea of the site. Um, so the permissive footpath is within these trees here on the west of the A272. This view is looking north, so the three maze roundabout is, is down here. Uh, and we're looking north at the A272. This here is the site access. Um, and as you can see at the moment, there's slightly less uh, tree screening um, where, the, where the site access is. Um, some further views along the A272. So this top picture is looking south towards the three major roundabout, which is just down here. Um, and this shows the western edge of the site um, and the site access just there. And then the, the uh, below picture indicates the permissive footpath here along the western side of the A272 and the view um, into the site access just over there. In terms of consultations and representations in relation to the application, uh, Winchester City Council objected initially uh, on based on a lack of adequate assessment for highways, landscape and archaeology impacts, but these have since been resolved by the applicant um, and our highways, landscape and archaeology um, consultants are satisfied subject to conditions which have been included in the appendix. Um, there have also been no objections from other statutory consultees subject to conditions which again are included in Appendix A. Um, Councillor Porter was informed of the application and I believe is speaking uh, today. Um, and we have received 208 public representations. We have also had um, one more which came in yesterday afternoon, um, but it didn't raise any further um, objections uh, that we hadn't already covered previously. <clears throat> in terms of key issues on the site, uh, obviously the, the 208 representations included a variety of issues. Um, the rural, rural location of the site, um, visual and landscape impacts of the development, highway impact and the possible safety, um, potential amenity and health impacts such as noise, dust and lighting, uh, concerns over the hours of working because it, the proposal also uh, includes the provision of 10 instances of nighttime working operations, um, a lack of a special need or local need for the site, lack of consideration of alternative sites, and impact on nearby recreational uh, activities, including the Littleton Stud, which is the equestrian facility um, I mentioned earlier. Um, hopefully all of these issues have been addressed in the report um, that you have all already seen. And so our recommendation would be that planning permission is granted subject to the conditions uh, listed in Appendix A and within the update paper that you should all have received. Thank you, Amy. Is there anything else you wish to say in the report? I mean, it's a clear report and it sets out the recommendations and the reasons why. Um, so if you've finished, I'll now pass on to the deputations. Um, and there are a number of deputations here. And the first deputation is uh, Councillor Stephen Burgess, uh, who is chairman of Littledon and Hairstock Parish Council. Mr Burgess, you have eight minutes. Mr Burgess. Good afternoon. Sir. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, you may yeah. not be able to see me, but I can hear you. 
Um, thank you very much for allowing me to speak at the Regulatory Committee. I haven't seen the update paper or the Annex A, and I hope I'm not um, overwriting that with my comments. Uh, I am the chairman of Littleton and Herstock Parish Council, and the Three Maids planning application covers an area just outside the northeast corner of the parish, civil parish. Uh, the Parish Council is aware this is one of two separate planning applications for recycling facilities located close to the Three Maids Hill roundabout on the A34. So our perspective when we look at this, we're probably looking at twice the amount of everything vehicle movements, dust and potential noise. And we see this as a significant sort of industrialization of what is a rural area, albeit close to proximity to a trunk road and a roundabout. We also understand that the other local parish councils of Headbourne, Worthy, Crawley and South Wanston have also objected to this application. And as we know, there have been 200 objections from residents <coughs> on the website. And in these objections, we can see the anxieties about the proposed siting and the prospect of noise, dust and increased traffic. Despite the explanations in the proposal, I know the Littleton residents can hear traffic moving along the A34. They can hear London trains in the distance and loud vehicles depending on the ambient weather conditions. And it is likely that residents, even a kilometre away, may well be able to hear these recycling operations. Now, given the public response, my overall impression uh, is that the residents of Littleton are somewhat bewildered why two recycling centres are suddenly appearing uh, at Three Maids Hill. So, to keep it simple, our objection to this planning application has three parts. Firstly, policy. I mean, we are concerned somewhat about the significant change of use for the rural area of Three Oh, sorry, Stephen, you're, you've muted yourself, I think. I've paused your time, but yeah, you're still muted. That's it, we can see you now. Thank you very much. I'm sorry about that. We all struggle with this technology at the moment. So, as though the proposed development would be screened from view, and the application argues it should be permissible under local plan policy because they seem to demonstrate an operational reason for it. But the Winchester District Local Plan, the policy you're probably all familiar with, the MTRA 4, is designed to protect the character of this area and provide controls on dust, noise, and, noise and traffic generation. And I, I, my limited the Hampshire Minerals and Waste Plan also seems to balance between operational needs and the impact on the countryside and its rural character. I, I don't envy you your decision that you have to make this afternoon. Now, even so, the proposed site is not lost in open countryside. It is an immediate neighbour of the Littleton Stud, which appears to have been downplayed in the application. And there is a new potential major housing estate starting to come up the hill in the near future. And I'm talking here about the redevelopment of Sir John Moore Barracks by the Ministry of Defence and the land upslope towards the Three Maids Hill area. There may be homes and buildings up to about 450 metres away by 2023. Now, we're all aware of the strategic and employment land availability assessment conducted by Winchester City Council, which also shows an enormous potential for long-term development right up to the Three Maids Hill roundabout in the next few years. And what we would like to see is some coherent and coordinated planning strategy for the whole area, rather than seeing small changes starting to appear through planning applications. So we remain unclear as to how the positioning of these aggregate recycling centres in the Three Maids Hill area fit into the rapidly changing local planning policies and the future spatial arrangements for North Winchester. Secondly, locality. We didn't think the planning application assessed the 
uh, location fully and ignored to some extent the Littleton Stud with a boundary only about 150 metres to the south, which is not agricultural land as claimed in the planning application. The neighbouring Littleton Stud has been around for about 100 years and is one part of a larger band of historic equestrian related land that runs around the village of Littleton. The stud is prominent in the racing world. It is carefully designed and intensively managed, and I believe they're, they are also down to speak this afternoon as well. From our perspective, horses are not an endangered species, I know, but these are not ordinary horses, and I understand the Littleton Stud's valuable performance horses are notoriously vulnerable to dust, respiratory problems and noise. I'm very short on time here, so I'll move on, except to say that the, the proposal to locate an inert recycling site next to a, an important national horse breeding centre appears to be inconsiderate and inappropriate. Thirdly, traffic. My understanding of the planning application is that it states that the HGV traffic will only arrive and depart using the nearby strategic road network in the A272. The site is close to the Three Maids Hill Junction from the A34, which is a positive aspect for this proposal. In practice, this is a north-south routing and routes to the east and west are generally poor in comparison. The application stated that HGV will not use the rural stud lane, which attaches to the Three Maids roundabout, but I do not remember this as a statement in the other planning application, which we're not discussing at the moment. However, the inference is that the HGV traffic will not pass through Littleton, Herstock and Crawley, which we can only applaud. However, knowing how the traffic moves around this area, we are unconvinced about these assurances and we remain concerned that HGVs, and not only these aggregate vehicles, will continue to be tempted, possibly influenced by SatNav, to travel cross-country, west, southwest, passing through perhaps Littleton or Crawley, to access the Herstock Road and along to the Stockbridge Road and perhaps out towards Salisbury and beyond. We already witness private and commercial traffic HGVs passing through the southern suburbs of Winchester, bypassing the A34 and M3 junction, perhaps moving to the M3 further south. That's a minute oh, remaining. I'm sorry? Did somebody speak? Sorry, that's, sorry that you've just got a minute left. Okay. Um, in summary, Littleton and Herstock Parish Council does not support this planning application uh, or any other recycling facility nearby. Thank you. And I must say, I, I, after you've asked me some questions, I'm, I'm going to have to leave, Chairman. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Burgess. Uh, members, do you have any questions that you wish to put to Mr. Uh, Councillor Burgess? With the appeal not. Uh, so if the, you have no question, you don't have any questions, Councillor Burgess. Um, you're welcome to stay if you wish to do so. I can uh, stay for another 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Chairman. OK, uh, so we move on then to the next deputy is David Bow uh, on behalf of landowners, I'm told. Good afternoon, Mr Chairman, members. Afternoon. Thank Good afternoon. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. My name is David Bow. I've been general manager of Littleton Stud for the past 20 years. Um, all of us at the farm have grave concerns about the impact the proposed recycling facility at Three Maids Hill will have on our business for all the reasons we set out in our objections letters. But this morning or this afternoon, I want to explain who we are and what we do. Little and Stud Farm has been in operation since 1930. It's not only a national, but a globally recognised producer of top class thoroughbred racehorses and has been in the same ownership since 1983. Uh, let me give you a snapshot of some of the achievements. We've produced three Cartier Horses of the Year. This is a globally recognised award, meaning that the horses concerned were deemed to be the best in the world that year. 
we've had mul we've won multiple group one races and for those not familiar with what that means a good equivalent would be winning a grand prix in formula one this season alone we have a filly called alcohol free who won the chievely park stakes group one and was ridden by the current champion jockey oshin murphy the race was a classic trial which puts us on course to have a very good chance of winning the 1,000 guineas. Now, there are only five classics run annually, and they include the Derby, the 1,000 guineas, which is for females, the 2,000 guineas for males, the Oaks, and lastly, the St. Ledger. These are the bedrock of British racing, where legends are made as the winners of these races are deemed to be the best of their generation and consequently have huge value for their breeding and stud value after racing. Here at Littleton Stud, we've built up an enviable portfolio of broodmares who've been successful on the track at the highest level and now themselves are breeding what will hopefully be the next generation of champions. Currently, we've got 87 horses on the stud between mares, most of which are pregnant, their foals, yearlings, and race horses home for their winter break from their respective training yards. Littleton Stud has, since its inception, been an idyllic place to raise horses because of its local, sorry, because of its location on Chalk Downland, which is ideal for providing the essentials for bone development and thoroughbred race horses. And this is why the main racing centres in England, in both Lambourne and Newmarket, as the say, are based because the same, the soil composition is similar to ours. The species, rich, the species rich pasture has been cultivated and manicured for horses using only organic fertilizers, specialist seed. And this is something that you can't recreate or buy. This environment has been developed over a century. The mature tree lines, paddocks, and they were the Elkerton family almost 100 years ago. The effort and investment that we make is substantial in the pursuit of excellence. And everything we do here at Littleton Stud is meticulous. From the pasture to stabling and to the layout of the individual yards comprising of some 120 stables. So having a crusher only 800 metres, not the 150 metres, that is to the house, but 800 metres to our nearest boundary undermines everything we've done. The yard and facilities at Three Maids Hill end of the farm comprise of a four bedroom staff bungalow, a barn with 20 stables, an automated horse exercise walker, exercise rings, field shelters, all of which were purpose built to enable us to separate racing stock from breeding stock, which is a mandatory requirement by our governing body. The farm has been thoughtfully laid out to facilitate us raising racehorses from conception through to maturity. And so there's a delicate balance to be struck with how we use the land and rotate the stock. So losing the facility at the three maids end of the farm would be catastrophic to the business as a whole. I was shocked to read the head of strategic planning's report. We are referred to as if we don't exist or are not important. The environmental health officer signed off on the report without ever setting foot on the farm or even before they read our objection. All the documentation so far has been from assumptions that the noise levels and dust will not affect anybody and that the ambient sound from the 834 makes or is equal to what will be generated. It's utter ridiculous. It's really ridiculous. These crushes are very loud and have spikes in the intensity of the noise they create. They are portable, however, as the ap applicant has stated, they will get one in once a month to do campaign crushing. So with so much at stake, why can one not be brought in for a day and then the noise measures, noise levels measured correctly? They say that they'll put in acoustic bonds to a height of one and two meters in places. How will this mitigate sound when the plant machinery is twice as high? When asked this question, they say that they will plant the buns with trees and other vegetation, but that's going to take years to get established. And at that level, we're not going to see any mitigation of noise. We employ 15 staff 
some of which have lived on site, which some of which which live on site in the six cottages on the farm. These staff and their families have lived and worked here for years. We are part of the fabric of Littleton Village and have a very positive impact on the local community and the economy. We provide apprenticeships, we provide work placements for Sparshall College and the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons, we host interest groups, we host open days. People walk, cycle and run through the farm daily. During the pandemic, we were inundated with people from the village and surrounding area who were able to escape the drudgery and come and see young foals, mares and wildlife. We are part of the we are part of village life, and hundreds of its residents use the footpath and surrounding um, and surroundings every week. Regarding the economy, all of the hay straw we use is locally sourced to the tune of several hundred tons per annum. Feed merchants, farriers, tradesmen, machinery services, tractors, lawnmowers, fuel, all locally sourced. As an example, our average vet bill is in excess of 100,000 a year. All this can is here to be scrutinised. We're a hugely important business and to be brushed aside and overlooked as if we don't exist is just wrong. At the very least, the decision on this application should be deferred until proper consideration and investigation of what we do and more importantly, what we stand to lose is taken into account. I invite you all to come and visit this farm where you can see for yourselves how beautiful and wonderful the place is and how, it, how our jobs livelihoods and the village will be affected by this application. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for that. Grateful for that. Um, members, do you have any questions of Mr. Bow? Uh, Councillor Quantrill. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bow, Councillor Burgess previously referred to um, the racehorses as particularly sensitive. Um, can you expand on that, please? Well, if you would imagine that these horses that we raise are not your average uh, horse, these are terrible race horses, elite athletes, and we send our mares to the premier stallions in Europe. So it's top bloodlines from throughout the world. So these are fundamentally elite athletes themselves and their preparation from the time they're born right through to when we actually send them into training at two years of age is meticulously managed. Everything from dust extracted hay to um, special feeding to bedding. We use straw with the mares and foals. We actually put the, as, they, as the mares, the foals are weaned from the mares, they're put onto dust extruded shavings. I mean, everything is meticulously managed. It can be seen, we, the, the amount of effort we put into this, and this is, the, all these horses are managed individually. So we don't manage them as a herd. They have characteristics. Some are quirky. Everything has to be, it's the amount of things that can go into a horse and can go wrong along the way are huge. But to add dust and to add noise into, you know, these horses stand in a stable, they're exercised. To have noise and spikes in noise, the ambient sound of the A34 is kind of, we all get used to it. It's, it's, it's kind of soothing. It's, it's part and parcel of, the, of, of where we live. Um, but to have bang, bang, bang crushers. And I've listened to them. I've gone and visited other sites. We're not about, we're not NIMBYs. We are all about recycling. But honestly, to have a, f a business that's been established for 100 years to be overlooked in this way and honestly jeopardising millions of pounds worth of stock. And I don't say that lightly. Great. Thank you very much. Any other questions of Mr. Bow? Councillor Mark. Uh, Councillor Cooper. Mark. Uh, thank you, Chairman. It's a, a very uh, brief question. It relates to the fact that you've you've got the A34 alongside, which you've already referred to. Yes. Um, or at least nearby. But there's also on my OS map a, a motocross circuit, which obviously is intermittent noisy sound. Does that impact on the horse at all in any way? Um, it. Uh, it's so rarely used now. It was destined to be the next big thing. There was going to be world championships and all sorts happening there. But <laughs> with you, it doesn't affect us um, as adversely as it would have done had it gone on as much. They did mitigate an awful lot of it by putting up absolutely massive sound bonds. So I'm rather familiar with the use of sound bonding 
um, uh, acoustic sound bonding. But um, to be fair, I have to say that the motocross hasn't affected us in the way that it might have done had it gone on to be the big um, event it was all posted to be before it went got planning. Thank you. Any other questions of Mr. Bow? If not, uh, thank you to Mr. Bow for attending. Um, I'll move on now to the next deputies, and that's Stuart Austin and Luke Bridges, who are speaking on behalf of the applicant. Uh, may I say to both of them, both previous deputies have raised the issue of dust, um, etc. Could you address those issues when you uh, make your, your deputation? And of course, noise. Good afternoon, members. Uh, I'm uh, Stuart Austin, the uh, planning agent for TMR. Uh, it will just be me speaking on behalf of the uh, applicant today. Uh, I had to appear at another committee for East Sussex as well. So uh, Luke Bridges was on, on standby in case my item on the agenda there overran. Um, and yeah, thank you for the other deputies as well. And uh, I appreciate their comments this morning or this afternoon rather. Uh, as you've heard from your officer and read within the committee report, the proposed development of the inert waste recycling facility at Three Maids Hill has been subject to detailed assessment and thorough analysis by key statutory consultees, including environmental health, county ecology, landscape and archeology span officers, the Highways Authority, Natural England, the Flood Authority and the Environment Agency, all who have no objection to the proposal. You have heard objections relating to the unprincipled countryside location of the site, highways impact and the potential for amenity impact. And the committee report clearly sets out the reasons why the proposal is acceptable on these grounds and accords with the development plan. However, I will expand on these issues further. As members of the committee are aware, as the Waste Planning Authority, Hampshire, are responsible for ensuring that the right infrastructure is provided in the right locations to enable the county to sustainably manage its waste and produce recycled materials required to support the local construction sector. As made clear in the adopted plan, this includes the need to provide additional inert waste recycling capacity. As members also know, the Waste Planning Authority have a specialist understanding of the requirements of this sector and recognise within the adopted plan that these facilities, which require large areas of open storage and processing, are more suited to countryside locations. The footprint and location of the available land at Three Meds Hill provides a range of benefits that make the site highly suitable for the proposed development. As members have seen from the site plans, the application of 1.8 hectares is effectively split equally between the operational land and, and areas that would be developed for the benefit of nature. A significant ecological enhancement as measured on DEFRA's biodiversity net gain calculator would result in transforming current low value agricultural land to a mosaic of habitats. Therefore, as well as according with waste planning policy, the development would also deliver on wider national planning objectives seeking to increase biodiversity. These new habitats have also been designed to effectively screen the operational area visually and acoustically by including a planted bund of up to two metres in height, as well as managing surface water runoff in accordance with sustainable drainage principles. As well as the opportunity that Three Mates Hill provides for delivering a high quality design for a new facility, its strategic location is also a major benefit. It has direct and safe access onto the main highway network and is centrally positioned within Hampshire to provide excellent connections to many of the major centres of waste production and recycled product markets in the county. In addition, HGVs transporting material to and from the site do not have to pass any res residential properties between the site entrance and the A34. With such excellent transport connections, TMR would have no day-to-day -day requirement to use local roads around Littleton, Crawley and Kingsworthy unless there was a development site in these localities that needed an inert waste collection or delivery of recycled product. It is anticipated that when operating at full capacity, the facility would generate about 76 HTV movements per day, that is 38 in and 38 out. Again, to address some of these concerns, this would not be 38 individual HTVs all trying to access the site at the same time. Rather, 
it would be primarily TMR HTVs operating on a turnaround basis, with, for example, five HTVs making a series of return journeys during the course of one day spread out from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. The same is true also for the site operations, which objectives of site have having the potential for noise impact on local communities. The facility, the facility would run different plant and machinery to produce a wide range of products. However, these facilities are not factories with all plant and machinery running continuously throughout the day. Different items would be required at different times depending on the nature of the material received at site and the demand for different end products. The noise assessment though has rightly considered a worst case scenario with all items of plant and machinery operating simultaneously. The conclusion of this worst case assessment with which the EHO agrees is that there will be no amenity impact in this instance. For most of the time, levels were well below this assessment level. For example, the concrete crusher would only be hired into site on a as required basis, anticipated to be once per month. Again, a key reason for this is the site's excellent location and size being both distant from residential receptors and adjoining a major A road with high background noise levels, as well as having capacity to design in high quality mitigation. As well as the planning condition requiring a full environmental management system containing measures on noise and dust control to be adhered to, the site would also be operated in accordance with an, with an environmental permit as regulated by the Environment Agency. The National Planning Policy Framework is clear that where an environmental permit is required, it is the agency who have primacy in regulating these matters and planning authorities should make decisions on the basis that these regimes work effectively. Nonetheless, I would like to reassure members that TMR are committed to operating the site in an environmentally aware manner and acting responsibly in respect to the local community. To date, this has been demonstrated through the focus they have placed on delivering a high quality site design and a comprehensive planning submission. And going forward, it will include operating in strict accordance with planning conditions and the permit. And TMR would be pleased to form a liaison panel with representatives from the local community, including Stud Farm and the parish councils. This will provide a direct line of communication for senior, to senior management at TMR to resolve any questions or concerns that arise, as well as providing a, formal, a forum for formal meetings with a commitment to act on key outcomes. The proposed facility therefore provides an excellent example of sustainable development, delivering economic, social and environmental benefits, and will play an important role in the future management of inert waste in Hampshire, and the positive recommendation from officers both the pre-application and formal application stages, together with the support of key consultees, is a clear demonstration as to the suitability of the site and its excellent design. I therefore respectfully urge members to adopt the recommendation before you today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Austin. Members, do you have any questions of uh, Mr. Austin on behalf of the applicant? Councillor Quantra. <clears throat> You're muted. Sorry, excuse me if I've missed it. Mr. Austin, could you be more specific about the um, dust mitigation? Um, I'm hearing from Mr. Bow and Councillor Verges, and also through the chairman, uh, that, that that's really a critical point. Yes, so the site would operate in accordance with the dust management plan uh, and the, the, the prime driver of that is to ensure that all dust is retained within the boundaries of the site. And that is something that the Environment Agency would seek to enforce. That includes a sort of range of measures from limiting stockpile heights uh, uh, and shaping those stockpiles so they don't uh, generate wind-blown material. Also ceasing certain operations depending on different meteorological conditions. Also reducing things like drop heights of material when you're loading and unloading vehicles and plant and machinery. And keeping site hall roads and stop hole materials damped down with use of a water bowser if necessary. And also in, in respect of the, uh, the stud farm, uh, I certainly appreciate the, the comments that are made, but uh, the in prevailing wind is from the direction of the sud farm towards the application site and then away across the A34. Mr. Austin, I, I, I've just got a question. Um, could you uh, tell me, as far as the site is concerned, uh, what screening there is 
to what height around the whole site and in relation to the site itself where is the plant uh, at what height is that? I think there's a special condition about its height being in relation to screening. There's, yes, yeah, so there's existing, quite a, uh, a lot of existing planting around the boundaries of the site, particularly on the east and southern boundaries. Uh, on the western side, on the A272, we're proposing to construct a bund which will have uh, new tree and shrub planting. That includes uh, up to 50 uh, specimen trees. So these are larger trees that have already be established as sort of 18 to 20 centimetres in diameter in the trunk size already. So it will provide immediate screening uh, on that boundary and also tree planting on the northern side of the site as well. In terms of the, uh, and the bund itself, acoustic bund will be two metres in height and that's the height that is being calculated by the noise model as providing the correct level of attenuation at that nearest property, which is 150 metres away. And one of the reasons for that also is that the site topography does fall um, from west to east. So where the operational plant is going to be sited is, will be lower than the, uh, the height of the bund. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, there's obviously the crushing plant is, is larger, but where it's positioned in terms of the bund height, two metres provides the attenuation that is required. Thank you for that. Are there any other questions of Mr. Austin? If not, thank you for attending. You're welcome to stay if you wish. Uh, and now we move to the county councillors. Uh, and the first one is Councillor Jan Warwick. Back to the committee in a different capacity. Jan. Yes, thank you. And good afternoon, Chairman. I saw you all eating your lunches there quick, quickly in our 10 minute break. Thank you so much for permitting me to speak um, on this application <coughs> adjacent to Three, Mil Three Maids Hill, just north of Winchester and on the very border of my county division. In fact, the Littleton Stud sits within my county division. I think we've had a very thorough report, um, both verbally and online from Amy in front of us along with a significant number of objections from local residents, from several nearby parish councils, and actually interestingly from Winch Winchester City Council itself, who are all understandably concerned about the potential impact on their lives, particularly around the levels of noise, of dust, of vibration, of on-site lighting, and the additional 75 or so daily HGV movements. We would hope to be reassured about the proposed two metre of bunding around the site in order to mitigate for noise and dust and theoretically to improve biodiversity as long as we've heard from the previous application that it is properly planted and maintained so that those plants grow and continue to grow um, to provide that benefit. But I still have some serious concerns that this application conflicts with policy associated with development in the countryside. So although the proposed Three Maids Hill site is undeniably close to the A34, it is actually located in a rather lovely productive corner of the countryside and actually to walk along past the Littleton Stud is absolutely stunning and breathtaking. There's no denying that that's in the countryside. So this raises a real concern for me about the principles of an industrial development or a bad neighbour site, if you like, on green fields in a technically rural area. The application is contrary to the Winchester District Local Plan Policy MTRA 4. And on this point, South Wonston Parish Council made a good, good um, deputation, identifying that three other brownfield sites with equally good access within 10 miles of this location would not have been contrary to this planning policy. I'm also aware that the visual impact of the large barn style structure, stockpiled waste and bunding is also contrary to the Winchester District Local Plan DM23 and that it would not have and it should not have any unacceptable effect on the rural character of the area. This includes tranquility and lighting and given that some operations will take place overnight, that new lighting should not be permitted in an otherwise unlit area. And perhaps this is a good time to remind you again of the Littleton Stud, so beautifully described by both David and Stephen. 
that the the effect of noise uncharacteristically at night will have on lying out animals and on the residents of those farms. And the stud owners actually are also raised, there's been no report, um, there's a lack of technical analysis of the particle size from this dust and what, what materials it actually is in this report. So under traffic and highways, a new access to the site is proposed off the ancient A272. You saw the photographs, it's a very straight road. It's a Roman road connecting, um, running from east to west, connecting East Sussex to Winchester. And Chairman, I can see there's now an update report from Hampshire Highways, although we still do not seem to have assurance about the details of visibility displays, the hedge and tree removal to allow these 75 heavy goods <coughs> vehicles to move safely in and out of this site along the A272. And I understand there are no speed studies as yet. This is a dead straight rural road, so you can imagine that cars tra travel very quickly. Um, and, and it would have been really nice had we been able to do a site visit, you could have seen this for yourself. And I know this is a consideration you would have asked about. The application is also short on details of the HGV routing. Although the majority of movements will take place, I'm sure, via the A34, this is a busy, often congested route, so there'll be undoubtedly diversions onto the nearby residential routes. So it'd be very helpful to understand from TMR the traffic plan and where HGVs are transporting this inert material to and from so that we can offer a level of protection to our residents in these rural parishes of Crawley and Littleton. Under climate change, I'm very pleased that items in the report 104 and 105 address climate change and that I understand that waste management and recycling is, of course, an important policy within the Hampshire Minerals and Waste Plan. It's outlined in policies 5 and 10 and 13, provided these sites enhance the natural environment and do not cause unacceptable visual impact. So can I ask also if officers have considered quantifying how sustainable this site is against going against our local policies and against the footprint of the daily distance travel um, by 75 HGVs every day and the daisy, daily diesel operation of the machinery in use. Under Heritage, it's reported by our county archaeologists that this is a site uh, with significant Bronze Age archaeology, and I understand there's a limited desktop only study of heritage at this time. There is a reference to archaeology in the conditions, so can the committee ensure that no development occurs on this site before full archaeological investigations take place and are properly conducted and their findings considered and mitigated for? So, Chairman, I'm closing now, um, but I really don't see the overwhelming evidence in support for this application that will justify ignoring a clear conflict with local planning policy and a significant impact on the countryside, our landscape and the unique location of the Littleton Stud. We know there are other more suitable brownfield sites available with good access, so I request you consider rejecting this application at this location. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jan. Members, do you have any questions of Councillor Warwick? OK, so if uh, we move on then to... Uh, Councillor uh, Philpott, think, Chairman, oh, sorry. sorry. Sorry, Chairman, I, I wasn't quite quick enough. I, I kept uh, tapping <laughs> on my uh, my hand and it for some reason okay. fell up. You went on my screen. Apologies for that. That's all uh, right, no problem. Yes, it's just a, a quick question for, for Council for Council Warwick, for, for Jan, if I could. And it, you mentioned, uh, Jan, in your, uh, in, in your in your comments that uh, you felt that there were other suitable brownfield sites that might be available. Clearly, our, our role here is to consider the planning application before us. We, we can't consider alternative and other sites in this, in this environment. We have to consider what we have in front of us, as you know. But um, in determining that, are, are, you, are you suggesting or saying that, uh, that you feel that proper uh, uh, consideration or, or inadequate consideration, I'm not trying to put words into your mouth, you understand, but inadequate consideration has been given to other alternatives. Is, is, that, is that how the, how the residents feel and, and how you feel? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And I, I, I know that, that several of the parish councils looked closely. There are seven 
potential sites that, that might be available in this location. Three of those are Brownfield and the parish councils who know this, this area well consider that those three would be better than this because of that rural location. So superficially on a map, it, it might look great because it's so close to the A34. The A34 is actually quite sunk at this level, so it sits below the site. And actually that, that area, Three Maids Hill, is particularly breathtakingly beautiful. And, and of course, the A272 is known to many of you as a, a stunning ancient route. So I think it's not, not straightforward, but certainly Personally, from a climate change perspective, I would pre prefer to see this on a brownfield site. And there are at least three of those um, available here. Yeah, thank you. And they are mentioned in the report, I think, Stephen. Um, if we move on then, if no further questions of Jan Warwick, uh, Councillor Jackie Porter, I think, is here. So the floor is yours, Jackie, last. Thank you. Last and, Thank you, and thank you for your time. And as uh, Councillor Warwick and my county divisions on my west side, her east side, actually uh, fit together rather like um, parts of a jigsaw, actually, at various <coughs> points, you won't be surprised to hear that my response is very similar to Councillor Warwick's. Uh, and in fact, when you talked about, when uh, Amy talked about the um, communities it would affect, uh, there are some others that are men aren't mentioned, and one was Headbourne Worthy, which is just to the southwest of this site, uh, southeast of this site, and of course uh, the newly developing Barton Farm or Kings Barton area, which is uh, just southeast as well. And um, Mr. Bow made a very powerful presentation about the impact on the business employing many, um, and. In the paper, it describes inert waste of soil, rubble, concrete, road planings, and the dust from those will be quite considerable. And it's also a concern not only to this site, but the one where we have just had a screening opinion um, of a solar farm site, uh, which is something like eight hectares. Uh, and the dust, again, that's to the northeast. So from the south, if the prevailing wind is from the southwest, as the applicant describes, um, there is a risk to the uh, the effectiveness of those solar panels. Um, the other point is about the concern about the lorries, 76 leaving or entering every day, um, and 10 evenings um, overnight uh, when traffic might come from uh, other directions other than the A34. Well, actually, the problem is that during the day, the congestion on the A34 is so bad, often by lunchtime, that those lorries will be taking additional routes, um, possibly along what's called Christmas Hill, which is, if you look on the map, there's another B road just alongside the A34 to the east. And they'll be coming up through Winchester overnight. Um, we've had works um, at the Junction 9, which have necessitated closing that route and therefore large experience of large lorries going through Winchester overnight. It's had such a bad impact, again, on the neighbours on the route of the old Andover Road, the Andover Road, the B3420, that um, it's actually had to result in some mitigation along there already because uh, of the impact it has on people's sleep patterns. So I would very much suggest that the 10 overnight um, uh, overnight allowances are not given as part of this, uh, but they become exceptions which have to be applied for because they have been so bad that um, our officers, uh, Mr Ackerman and Mr Gray, have been personally involved in responding to uh, individual neighbours who have felt that their uh, concerns were so great. And um, I also know in terms of climate change that this business, this business will be operating from seven o'clock in the morning there is no public transport to this site before 7.30 in the morning. There's a north and south bound route that comes to the Eighth Maids Hill, Three Maids Hill, um, and a person could get off a bus there and go to work. But at the moment, there is absolutely no public transport from any direction until 7.30. So I do recommend that this, this permission starts later at 7.30. Uh, we know that lorries will arrive earlier anyway, so we know that uh, neighbours will be disturbed before 7.30, but uh, uh, before 7 o'clock. But certainly I believe that the public, if we are employing people on sites, they should be able to get there by public transport. So I'm asking as a result of that, that if this is uh, sub um, given a, a green light, that there's no access to any of the lanes that surround this junction. Um, and it, it should be 
by definition on the A34. The A272, as Councillor Warwick said, is a very quiet, rather beautiful Roman road route um, with um, speeds of 60 miles an hour. And as such, I think it's very dangerous at the moment to suggest that um, this planning application could be given without a thorough investigation of the entrance design to this site. Um, also, as lorries come off and on of it, uh, it will inevitably be, it's only a two lane road, a single carriageway road, that um, two single carriageways, that the footpath uh, environment on the other side of the road will be somewhat degraded by lorry movements going in and out. So I'd like to make sure that if this were accepted, um, that it would mean that the design of the entrance would be such that the, the HGVs had a full turning circle within the carriageway of the road on which they would be coming in and out and not encroaching at all onto the side of the road. Um, other point, other people and uh, Mr. Uh, Councillor Burgess made a point that there's another site still live uh, in a planning application actually on the motocross site. You asked about the motocross site. It was a temporary permission for 10 years. Uh, that site is not used, it's used incredibly infrequently now and it won't be being be, be renewed. Uh, the noise impact of that was so great that actually, and it was only allowed 12 times a year. Um, it was so great that actually the environmental health officer from Winchester was frequently up there checking the emissions from the vehicles um, before they started their day. And even so, we had a lot of problems with that. Um, on page, um, sorry, uh, we are concerned about the cumulative impact, therefore, of those two sites. And as we've said before, there's a solar farm had a, an application just north of that. Um, at the moment, it's just a screening application, but it's due in any time. Uh, so that actually puts a huge change to the character of these um, mid hans open down landscape area, which, as Councillor Warwick and others have said, is really beautiful, uh, particularly viewed from the A272. I think uh, you, you do believe you're on deep countryside when you're driving or cycling along that. Um, and also, we do know that that area has got high archaeological potential. Just a few uh, kilometres or about a kilometre south of there on the King's Barton, Barton site, they found such extensive uh, number of um, archaeological remains. Um, and the archaeological works took actually a lot longer than we were all expecting because of the high potential of that area. And so I do agree as well, we should have a full archaeological investigation. The A272, we've, we've discussed, it is a route that at the moment has a, um, a permissive path along it. And as such, it links the rural bridleways and rural roads to the north. And I do know lots of groups that actually cycle along it as well as walk along it. Um, and I do believe that we should be making sure that the environment of that is conserved. So... I was, um, I'm, I have to declare an interest, I'm also the Cabinet Member for the Built Environment at Winchester City Council, and I was involved in looking um, just as at the site, and I was aware that Winchester City Council had made um, an objection, and I still st continue that objection on MTRA4, which is about policy in the countryside, and why, I query why, this is an essential facility in the countryside, um, which is uh, DM10. I am concerned about the special, special trees and hedges, particularly on the side of the road, of those, that, those hedges and road um, trees that are owned by Hampshire County Council in DM24, and uh, the archaeology, which is DM26, which our own art county archaeologist had raised in paragraph 88 of the paper. I really welcome the applicant's uh, belief in a community meeting. It's very encouraging to hear that. Um, and I certainly would ask for all community all parish councils, but also all local amenity groups to be involved. But my main question really is, how does this uh, application justify um, HMWP 5, 10 and 13, the uh, Minerals and Waste Plan 5, 10 and 13? What is the special need or exceptional circumstances that makes this open air site justified? And um, we still don't know why or how this development meets this criteria. And, and I just raise that as a subject for you to discuss. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Porter. Members, do you have any questions which you wish to put to her? I can see a hand gone up, but I'm not sure whose. It's Andrew. Andrew. 
Um, Councillor Porter, um, yeah. the, uh, the A272, um, which um, is an old Roman, <coughs> as we both know, yes. um, as it yes. goes down to the corner of your division and mine at Hill Farm Garage, yeah. um, yes. which, is, which is already a black spot, um, did you look at the, uh, the traffic implications down there and the potential increased dangers at, at what is already a well-established black spot for traffic. No, but I do take. I, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't specifically because I was looking particularly at the impacts in my own division. But I understand completely what you're saying, and I am um, the the accidents on that site are very well documented, and I understand exactly what you're saying. It would be very difficult to take a left or right-hand bend turn at that junction for an HGV. So I think it really supports the argument that actually the traffic implications are not as simple as they sound. Uh, the A34 and up to that roundabout is about the only safe way to come on to that, to that site uh, and not really uh, to the 272 at the top uh, onto A A30. That's absolutely correct. Does that answer your question, Andrew? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Any other further questions of Councillor Porter? If not, then uh, deputy. Yes. Have we got another one? Yes, please, Chairman. Uh, right. Okay, Ray. <coughs> Just a quick question, Councillor Porter. I think you referred to the motocross circuit. Yes. Has that got permanent planning permission? No, it was a temporary planning permission, and in fact. The, um, the planning application for uh, another site similar to this one for road planings is on the east side of the A34. Um, and uh, while it's currently being withdrawn for reconsideration, um, it, uh, because of certain objections, it, it also has the um, expectation that it will end up on that site. So it will end up, we will end up with two very similar sites on either side of the A34 if it goes ahead. But actually it would replace the what would be the motocross site. Thank you, Councillor Porter. That's very useful information for me. Thank you. Right. Any other further questions of Councillor Porter? If not, then thank you to all the deputies and for attending. You play no further part in discussions on this item. And I will now ask uh, members whether you have any questions of the officer, Amy Dales. Councillor Cooper. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I'm referring to the um, OS map of the area and note that the application site uh, has a spot height of 94 metres and the land is rising to the north. Uh, and then falling to the south uh, in this sort of lovely chalk downland area. I also note the motocross um, uh, circuit is at a lower level, uh, around about 75 metres in height and actually in a, a shallow dry valley. Uh, obviously a better site for something noisy. Can the officers please confirm uh, the uh, potential of the motocross site uh, for a recycling site? Uh, I think I'll have to defer to either Dave or Chris on this one. I think um, I think I probably just need to yeah step in there, Councillor Cooper. That's um, obviously we're not in a position to determine that application today, clearly, and not really in a position to offer any opinion on it. If we do bring that application forward to you, it will be determined at that time um, on its merits. <coughs> so, um, as things stand, I'm unable to give you any advice on uh, what may or may not ultimately be a recommendation on that site, I'm afraid. I, I think I read between the lines, Chairman. Thank you. Any other further questions of the office? <clears throat> Chris, were you wishing to add anything? Not at this stage. Councillor Chowdhury appears to be uh, wishing to speak, Chairman. Okay. All right. Councillor Chowdhury. 
Um, thank you, Chairman. I'm just asking a question that can this application can be deferred and uh, some stage we have a site meeting or the time is so close that we can't do it. I think, you know, I know due to the present uh, pandemic uh, crisis, don't know when we will be able to have a site meeting or we can go and have a look at individually. It's better to have a first, you know, the, the best thing is to see the site and then determine the application, but I just seeking that voice of the officer and yourself. Where we stand with this? I, I think if you were to, I think you would need to propose a. Yes, I'm uh, going to propose that this application be deferred. If I got any any uh, person who's going to second to take a vote on it, um, Carolyn, can you add anything to that? Councillor Latham. Um, Add anything to that, sorry, in terms of? The suggestion that, that it should be deferred for a site visit, um, and I've suggested that it would, that, that would need um, a seconder and a proposal, because uh, otherwise we have to d make a decision on it today. Yeah, yeah, indeed. I will, I will second that, Chairman, uh, and the reason being is we have experience of site visits uh, at, di at district level, uh, socially distanced, they do work, they are legal, we are going to work, and I think Councillor Chowdhury has uh, made an interesting proposition which I fully support. Right, um, so... Chairman, um, yeah. we, ha we have one more question from Councillor Quantrill. Would you like to take that before yes, we we'll take vote that on the deferment? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's not material to the uh, suggestion for a site visit. So if the site visit um, is agreed, then my question may or may not be relevant. So I'll, I'll hold off uh, until the issue of site visits um, is uh, furthered. Thank you. Chris, do you want to comment on that or sh can we go straight to a vote on it? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think Councillor Cooper is right. It's possible to do a socially distanced site visit. We <laughs> have avoided them um, during the, the pandemic up, up to this point. Um, and generally, I felt they've not been essential to, to uh, your determination of applications. If you think in this case it is essential, then we can we could make it work. Um, and um, so I, I think you you um, the advice would be that you uh, take a vote on the need for a site visit first. Um, and if that is agreed, then then that is what we will do. Yeah. At the moment, I take the view that uh, the feeling on the committee at the moment seems not to be in favour of the application. Um, I feel that if there were a site visit, we could actually see what is involved and what the risks are with regard to noise, dust uh, and highways. Um, and we would have a better understanding of the effect on, 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 on the stud. So I'm inclined to go with a site visit if other members. So I think I would be inclined to go with a vote for a site visit, frankly. Councillor Quantrill. You're muted, Councillor Quantrill. I'm of the same opinion, Chairman. Mr Bauer has given us that invitation. Um, I think we should take him up on his offer. OK. Well then, Katie, uh, I think we go to a vote on a site visit. OK. OK, so I'll go through members alphabetically um, and if you could just confirm whether you're for in favour of um, deferring pending a site visit um, against or abstaining. So, Councillor Bolton? For a site visit. Okay. Councillor Carter? For. Councillor Chowdhury? <coughs> Councillor Chowdhury, yes, you're in favour of the site visit as your proposal. Yes, four. Yes, yes. I have Thank you. Um, Councillor Mark Cooper? Uh, four. Uh, Councillor Rod Cooper? Yes, four. Councillor Gibson? Yeah, I'm four. Councillor House? Four. Councillor Huckstep? 
Four. Councillor Irish. Four. Councillor Latham. Four. Councillor Philpot. Oh, yes, four. And Councillor Quantrill. Four. Thank you. Um, that is unanimous, Chairman, with um, a favour okay. of deferral. Right. So we put that to one side until next year. <laughs> right, until we can do a site visit. OK, so ever onwards, um, we move on to land at Roshot in Christchurch, which is, I think, Chris, you're going to present this one. This is for an application for a further uh, adjournment uh, uh, for, of, until we get a, a Section 106 agreement sorted out. The application came originally, I think, to us in July 2019, and we've had loads of adjournments so far. And uh, Chris, you're going to ask or give the reasons why we need another one for three months, which might well be the last one. So over to you. And we have one deputy as well on this. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I might bring Lisa in yeah. in a second because she, she is with us. Um, I am here. Um, so Lisa's been very close to the negotiations on this in, in recent months. Um, and I'm a little frustrated and disappointed in the <coughs> that we haven't got this resolved yet. But I'll just hand on to Lisa and she can just give you a little bit more detail, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, uh, members. I um, hope you're all well this afternoon. We're um, getting towards the end of the meeting, obviously. Um, you know, the you can see the report before you is asking for an extension to um, the period to essentially agree the Section 106 for Roshot. So Roshot obviously was a, a quarry that we uh, dealt with um, in the summer of 2019 significant quarry down on the, on the Dorset border um, and we've been in discussions and, and in advanced nego negotiations with the applicant since that point to agree the section 106 <coughs> which largely relates to um, a ecological management plan and rights away issues. Now, officers, me in particular, and our legal officers and our ecological officers have been working very hard on trying to get to a position that we would have got this um, through the through the door before Christmas. Um, and as Chris has indicated, we are obviously quite disappointed we haven't um, got to that position. Um, hence why I've had to come back with this report asking for a three month extension to um, the, the negotiation period. We are at advanced stages we're very close to being there but there are still some significant issues that need to be discussed between the applicant um, and uh, ourselves and unfortunately that just could not be achieved before the 30th of December deadline so hence the report to you you'll notice in paragraph 7 of the report um, this the report makes it very clear this is the last time we would be seeking um, an extension to this time frame um, it's officers view that if we do not are not unable to agree the section 106 before the end of March that the application will need to come back to committee for reconsideration and that's largely due to the passage of time that has taken place since we you last um, considered the actual determination of the application um, and, and to ensure that what's being determined is, is on the, the most up-to-date and sufficient information. So that's the report as it currently stands. Um, I'm, I'm un, of the understanding that the um, applicant's agent is in, is in the meeting to potentially do a deputation, but I'm happy to answer any further questions should you wish to ask me any. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Um, I'll now bring in Robert Williams on behalf of the applicant for his deputation. Good afternoon. Afternoon. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you see me okay? Yeah? Okay, yeah. thank you. Well, good afternoon, Chair and committee members. Uh, my name is Robert Williams, and on behalf of the applicant for the development of Roshock Quarry, I thank you for the opportunity to speak today. It will be no secret to you that matters with regard to the signing of the 106 agreement attached to the, pros, the proposed planning permission has drifted on for some time. I've been involved just a short time and I brought to the table a, a practical approach which has helped to overcome areas that were seen as major obstacles. Substantial work has been done. Over the last five weeks there have been regular meetings with your 
uh, Authority's planning team and a basic 106 <coughs> agreement is now in circulation. I anticipate that your own in-house experts will review this document and will respond within a reasonable time frame. I'm fully committed to bring a resolution to what is an important mineral excavation site for both the applicant and your authority. I hope the officers involved have indicated to you that we're now seeking a resolution which is acceptable to all concerned. I ask that you give consideration to the officer's report and my commitment to bring this matter to an agreeable solution within the time frame suggested. Thank you so much. Thank you for that, Mr. Williams. Um, well, that sounds promising. Lisa, do you want to add anything to that? Not really, um, Councillor uh, Latham, thank you. I mean, as Bob has indicated, um, both Bob and I have been <laughs> in particular um, in, in ready co correspondence and, and in meetings on this in the last um, a couple of months trying to push this forward. The commitment is there from both sides. Um, you know, COVID hasn't helped it, but there are other issues that have proved to be more complicated to, to, to negotiate out. But I do feel that we are we are nearly there. Um, we will be re um, responding to the um, the draft that was submitted to us by the applicant at the end of last week, um, hopefully um, in the first week of January. And I have asked the estate that we are in a position that we have essentially looked to, to agree a draft by the end of January to make sure that we're in a situation that this is agreed before the deadline, um, if that is agreed by committee today. Thanks for that, Lisa. Um, then I, I hope we're all agreed on this one. I think the recommendation is effectively that there's an extension of time to the 31st of March um, 2021 to complete the Section 106 agreement, um, which was in accordance with our resolution made on the 19th of June 2019. Can I assume that that is agreed by all members? Agreed, Chairman. Yeah, good. Agreed. Thanks for Agreed. that. Agreed, yeah. Chairman. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, good. Um, we haven't quite finished yet. Um, so there's one. <laughs> well, thank you anyway. Oh, no, you're, you're <laughs> finished with Mr. Williams. Oh, thank there's you so one much. One item left on the agenda, which <laughs> is the monitoring enforcement report for, oh, from no. Dave Smith. Thank Dave. you. Uh, good afternoon, members. Um, as you all know, this is the uh, regular update we have on the monitoring and enforcement uh, team to look at what you've made decisions on over the previous months and uh, to keep you updated on what's been happening around the county. Um, obviously, it's there for you to read. I'm happy to answer any questions you have on it. There's just a couple of points that I wanted to highlight for you. Um, both <coughs> do the A303 incinerator bottom ash facility. Uh, the first is to say that um, at the last committee, you agreed to um, allow them an increased throughput for this year and next year, whilst the Kent facility was being sorted out. Uh, well, I'm happy to report that Kent committee gave permission for that facility two weeks ago. So they have now all the necessary paperwork in order and we'll start constructing that facility in the new year. Um, once they do, all they need to do to, to help us is to get the concrete pad down, <clears throat> then they will actually be able to use it to start storing material before they actually need the um, recycling uh, facility constructed. So um, they see no issue at all with um, complying with the one year extra for the increased throughput and probably won't even need it. They've said they've not actually needed the throughput, the increased throughput this year. Um, so that looks like it's um, going to be sorted out and not a problem. The other thing is to do with the former wheelabrator site, the front field as they call it. Um, you'll recall that we gave a temporary relaxation of controls to allow them to use it for temporary storage of IBAA, that's the, the aggregate, um, during the COVID problem. Um, as it's turned out, um, well, the, we gave them permission till September initially and then a subsequent permission till March of next year and we told them that we wouldn't extend it any further. Uh, it turns out that they do not feel that they will be able to empty that site by the end of March next year 
And so we'll be submitting a planning application to construct a concrete surface and drainage system on that field to allow them to retain it for the story of IBAA. Now they have informed the local liaison panel and parish council about uh, the need for this application. As of yet, I've not actually heard anything. I don't know if Councillor Gibson will have actually heard anything more. Um, so obviously that is something that will come across your desks in the next couple of months. David, I've heard nothing. Right, thanks for that. Andrew, I think Councillor uh, Cooper's got his hand up. <clears throat> Chairman, thank you very, very briefly. David's reports are always the most interesting part of the agenda. I'm just wondering, Chairman, whether in the future you consider uh, that we rotate it through the agenda. So one time it's first on the agenda, for example. It does seem unfortunate. The officer, who's very, very busy, I understand, has been kept waiting four and a half hours before he can present his report, which is to say is the most interesting part of the whole agenda. Couldn't possibly the our meetings don't last four and a half hours, Councillor Cooper. Um, Councillor Quantrill, did you have a question? Uh, no, thank you. OK, Councillor I, I can ask, ask that directly of the officer outside the All meeting. Right. Thank you. OK, Councillor uh, Andrew. Yeah, it's interesting that um, there are two um, uh, uh, issues in my area. So my area is obviously full of bad people. <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> just to ask a question, I've only recently uh, joined the regulatory committee, but you've got the White House field, Goodwood Clafford thing. I know there was um, a, uh, there was a, um, a um, the applicant and Tess Valley were had a difference of opinion as to how much had been filled. Are we happy now that um, um, there is no more land, um, no more dumping to be done on that field? Well, I wouldn't go, go that far. Uh, we are happy that a planning inspector <laughs> at appeal has actually now set out what is the approved uh, land form for that site. Now it, it does allow for some regrading of parts of the site, so some cut and fill operations, so some bits are a bit low, some bits are a bit high, um, but he cannot do any work on there until he has the necessary permit from the Environment Agency. They do not think his application is valid and has enough information on it. So my current understanding is that he has appealed the agency's non-determination of his permit application to allow him to complete the regrading of that site as allowed by the planning inspector. Uh, thank you. That's, that's, that's clear to me. Thank you. Any other questions of uh, Mr. Smith? If not, then I think we've concluded the agenda one way or another. <clears throat> so thank you to everybody for attending. Um, wish you all a happy Christmas, however you're going to enjoy it um, as safely as possible. And I'm going to now formally close the meeting and ask the webcast to be turned off. So, thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Same thank to you. you. Happy. Bruce, can you give me a call? I'll call my landline when you're ready. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Mark. See you, Andrew. Bye. Bye.